Okay, before um, the chair open the call the meeting to order, um, I like I want to start by saying welcome and congratulations to your appointment to the Transportation Commission. The city appreciates your involvement in local, local government. A reminder, please turn on your video and unmute yourself uh, for the oath of office. Um, and also when I ask you to state your name, please state your name one at a time in alphabetical order by last name. Um, and keep your hand raised for a little longer after the oath, please. Now, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, and please state your name. I, Robert Darrell-Zario. Who was next? Ben. I, Ben, Benjamin Fong. I, Sarah Graham. I, Farid Javandel. And I, Ken McCroskey. Do solemnly affirm. Do solemnly, solemnly affirm, affirm. That I will support and defend. That, that I, I will support, support and defend. defend. The, Constitution the, the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. United States. United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution, and the Constitution of, the State of California. State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against, against all, all enemies, enemies, foreign and domestic. And domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear, I will bear true bear faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution, the Constitution of the United, of the United States. States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the, and the Constitution, Constitution of, the of the State of California. California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take, that I take this, this obligation freely. freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any without mental, any mental reservation, reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. And that, that, I, that I will well and faithfully discharge. discharge. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. So, Robert Del Rosario, do you attest to the oath that you just took? I do. You may lower your hand now. Ben Fong, do you attest to the oath that you just took? I do. Thank you. You may lower your hand now. Sarah Graham, do you attest to the oath that you just took? I do. Thank you. Farid Javandel, do you attest to the oath that you just took? I do. Thank you. Ken Mokrosky, do you attest to the oath that you just took? I do. Thank you. Uh, so please go ahead and sign the oath and return back to me. Congratulations, Transportation Commission members, and thank you for your volunteer effort. Now I can turn it over to the commission now. Great. And thank you so much and welcome all especially our new members and welcome back older members. Um, so uh, staff, do we need to do a roll call after having just called all the names? I think after, yeah, we're now this is the formal mo meeting calling the meeting to order. And then, all right. I'll assume that was done. Uh, Robert Del Rosario. Commissioner Del Rosario. Present. Commissioner Fong. Here. Commissioner Graham. Present. Commissioner Javandel. Present. And Vice Chair McCroskey. Present. Fabulous. Well, uh, let's get started right away with our public comment. I'm gonna remind uh, anybody who's in attendance that this is the time for you to speak on matters that are not otherwise on our agenda for the evening. And uh, you'll be given uh, three minutes or up to three minutes. And uh, as you know, we can't respond to these items in, in this meeting or discuss them because they are not on our official agenda. With that, I'll turn it over to uh, Jeff Bond to uh, let people in to speak. Thank you, Vice Chair McCruskey. Uh, Jeremiah, you may begin to speak. Thank you so very much. Um, 
So yeah, first I'm going to suggest obviously school zones. You know, we need school zones in our municipal code book. The slowest speed around our schools is 25 miles an hour. I don't know what's up with that. It's way too fast. We're the only city in the Bay Area that doesn't have school zones in our municipal code book. You know, Mr. Jovendale, you got school zones in Berkeley. So maybe we should hook up Albany with school zones, please. Um, also, a few things here. We need to um, have some supervision on the construction going on on our city intersections. Um, it's very unpedestrian friendly. These people get a bid and they come in and do constructions on our intersections to redo the sidewalk and they just take over. They just don't care what's going on with anybody and nobody from the city is gonna go monitor these intersections every day to make sure they're safe for pedestrians. It's really dangerous. Um, also, we need to do a speed survey on Solano. I know we got the equipment, we need to do a speed survey. AC transit buses are going way too fast. We got Cornell Avenue. AC transit buses flying up Solano, flying down Solano. What's going on with that? Um, also, this is called transportation committee. Did this committee used to be called traffic and safety or transportation and safety? I'm just wondering where the word safety went. Um, also, we need speed bumps around our elementary schools. I've been suggesting for years have speed bumps on Talbot by Solano where our pickup and drop off is, you know. Um, also, we need to have mile per hour signs posted. I don't see one mile per hour sign on Solano. What's the speed limit on Solano? I don't see a mile per hour sign on Solano anywhere. And when we do put one up, please don't put 25. Please put 15. It's our business district. We need 15 miles per hour on Solano. We need it safe. Also, the whole Sprouts Plaza, if you look at the intersection on Monroe and 10th in front of Banfield Pet Hospital, east and west on Monroe at 10th, we need a stop sign. We need a stop sign. We need a stop sign. Look at AC Transit right there flying. We need a stop sign on Monroe and 10. Can you guys go check that out? If you're going east or west on Monroe at 10th Street, we need a stop sign, you guys. Thank yeah, you. Man, we need <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you, guys. I don't see any more public speakers at this time. There we need uh, mile per hour signs when we enter the city limits. Oops. There were also several court comments written directly to the commission that were posted on the, with the agenda packet. I also want to acknowledge with respect to correspondence, there was one email that the commissioners received related to an incident that occurred, a, a collision at uh, Marin and San Pablo involving a bicyclist. Uh, we've tried to reach the person who sent the email to the commission to confirm that they wanted that information available, posted publicly, uh, since it did reference some, some um, health matters. So um, until we were able to get confirmation of that, I want to acknowledge that we received it and that there was a traffic collision and that the person who wrote it was expressing concerns about the, the, the function and design of that intersection. But um, we decided to caution, uh, err on the side of caution and not post that until we can get confirmation that um, the person's intent was that it be po posted publicly. Great. And I'll just say that um, while we can't talk about any of these issues right now as a, as a commission, we can bring up these issues at the end of the meeting when we're talking about future agendas. So uh, hold, hold the thoughts that uh, you feel are important and we'll talk about those later. With that, let's uh, move right into the presentation and we'll start out with our monthly police data on collisions and citations. Thank you, Vice Chair. 
reporting out on two months of police data for November, months of November and December. In November, there was one pedestrian collision reported and zero were reported in December. Bicycle collisions, there was zero reported in November and one in December. Uh, overall vehicle collisions were nine and 12 for the two months and injury collisions were two and seven for November and December. And there were zero moving citations issued in November and four in December and zero DUI arrests in November and one in December. And that concludes the presentation. Great. So uh, just by way of, of introduction to the process in case uh, our new members haven't been involved before, uh, we'll generally have uh, a presentation by staff on, on an item and then we'll have questions from commissioners um, then we'll turn it over to the public for any comments or questions and then bring it back to the commission for um, observations and direction to staff of one kind or another. So holding your uh, opinionated comments and directions for the moment, does any commissioner have uh, a question about this data? And, and I know it's the first time some of you are seeing it or likely. Uh, so if there are questions about the format, we, we've adopted kind of a, a rolling year-by-year uh, -year format as we go, and we've been making changes over time uh, to make that make the data more readable and understandable. And if you have ideas, uh, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So any commissioners' questions? Uh, Del Rosario. Uh, thanks, Commissioner McCoskey, and thanks for the, the, the background explanation. That's very um, helpful. Thanks for going up to Steve. Um, question for staff on the moving citations uh, graph. So it looks like uh, at the start of the, of the shelter in place order for the pandemic that the moving citations have basically gone to zero um, or very, very low. Um, and I know that. Um, I don't think the I, I don't I don't know if that's commensurate with the amount of vehicle traffic that we're seeing out there, and so I'm just wondering if there's different different protocols in place because of COVID, or is there other reasons for that? Yes, there were um, there was a lo less proactive enforcement that the uh, police department was was putting in place with, as a result of, of COVID, which we reported on the first several months. Um, I'm assuming that that's still in place now, which is why those numbers have stayed low, even as vehicle volumes have increased. Thanks. Any other commissioners? Then I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff Bond to uh, open up for public questions on this topic. Hey, Jeremiah, please go ahead. Hey, it's Jeremiah real quick. Um, yeah, I do know about that traffic collision um, on Marin. Uh, we reviewed the footage uh, from Arco gas station and we, we caught the truck, but we don't know the license plate, but we know it was a white pickup truck. And um, the lady fell and she was injured and it happened on a Thursday. At, mm, I don't want to be wrong on the time, so I don't want to blow that. But, you know, what my comment is really is that I called California Highway Patrol since it's uh, State Highway 123. I called um, Highway Patrol in San Francisco and I talked to their head. I got transferred two times. I said, I want to talk to someone important. So I got transferred by the dispatch to someone in charge and they told me directly, are you ready for this? They told me that those traffic cameras that they have on San Pablo and Marin, they don't record. Can you believe that? Those cameras are not recording. I don't, I don't understand that. And they said the cameras aren't recording only within the city limits of Albany. 
I said, well, how about the traffic cameras on San Pablo and Berkeley? Oh, yeah, those are all recording. How about El Cerrito? Oh, yeah, those are all recording. Something's wrong with Albany. I mean, a lot's wrong with Albany, but we're going to fix it. So somebody on this committee, if you're on a, some sort of subcommittee with Caltrans or Highway Patrol or we got a state, we have a state highway in our city limits. So somebody on this committee has got to be able to talk to the highway patrol. So we would know who that truck is. We'd have a license plate. We could catch that hit and run. But we can't because the cameras are not recording. You know, I don't know what's going on with that. Maybe the city, we could put our own cameras up and record it. You know, we need some recordings, especially on San Pablo. There's so many accidents, you know, and, and it's just sad that the cameras are not recording on San Pablo and Albany. Something's wrong with that situation. So please, someone, someone on this committee, just live up to your oath, live up to the Constitution and talk to the state. Say, hey, can we just get those cameras to record? Because we would have been able to catch that hit and run. That person would be in jail. You know, so please, please do a, the city a favor and figure out what's going on with the traffic cameras on San Pablo. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. I don't see any other public speakers. All right, so we'll bring it back to the commission. Uh, commissioners, have any opinions or statements about the police report? I'm not seeing any other uh, commissioners with uh, with statements. I, I would respond to uh, Jeremiah uh, that um, I wasn't aware that uh, Albany is being treated any different than, than other places with Caltrans intersection cameras. That's uh, interesting. Um, I personally feel that uh, traffic cameras recording both uh, is both a uh, a privacy issue. Uh, it's also a bandwidth issue. Uh, who's going to look at the video that you record and how is that accessed? Um, and uh, if if you're really looking for a, a near term change, uh, that might actually be something that you want to take up with the, uh, the group that's looking at policing in general and not our group. Uh, I think there are a lot of issues that need to be considered and uh, it sort of goes beyond our bandwidth in many ways. Um, if I may, um, uh, Commissioner McCroskey, yeah. I believe, I may be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure those cameras that you see on the light standards at the intersections are video detectors. They're not intended to be security cameras that are reviewed. I think they're intended to identify vehicles and bicyclists and so forth. Um, I'm, I'm familiar with that uh, at non-San Pablo intersections in, in Albany. Uh, I know that uh, like at uh, Buchanan and Jackson and, and Marin and, and Santa Fe, those those cameras are, are just movement cameras and not video recording cameras or not certainly not used that way. Um, but at one time, there were cameras on San Pablo that could be accessed via a website uh, in Albany, of, of locations in Albany. And I don't know if that's changed. In my 15 years, we've never had that capability with, at least within the community development department. There was um, an attempt to put that in on I-80. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if that's still functional or not. Commissioner Javendal? There, there were some cameras on San Pablo that you could log into the website and see um, if I recall, the one that we had was right outside the police department, uh, pretty much at uh, Buchanan and San Pablo was about the closest. But yeah, as Jeff says, as far as I know, the rest of the, the cameras are just the video detection cameras with the signals, and those aren't designed to record. They, they just are a, a constant rolling 
static snapshot that detects changes in the background, whether there's vehicles or not. Okay. If there are no other comments, I think we should move the meeting along to the, uh, to the next item, which is the uh, shared mobility data presentation. Thank you, Vice Chair. So this is reporting out on numbers reported from gig car share. Um, there is a jump in the data in middle of 2019, which reflects a change in the, the how the data is processed at gig. So that explains why there's sort of a before then and after change in the numbers. Uh, similar to the police data, this is reporting on two months worth of data, November and December and active memberships uh, for gig in Albany were 209 in November and 156 in December. And Albany trip starts were 489 in November and 396 in December. Um, I'll end there and just see if there are any questions regarding this from the new commissioner's oral text. Commissioner questions? Okay, then uh, Jeff, would you see if there are any public comments? Yes, we have one public comment. Jeremiah, you may go ahead. Thank you. Um, if someone from the public wants to ride a gig car, um, do they go to the website for gig? Is that an app to download? Um, and what are the locations in Albany that the city has approved for gig to park? Because I've seen a gig, gig car on San Pablo within the 90 minute zone. So does the gig car get a parking ticket by Anna? I mean, does she come around and mark the tires and give the gig cars parking tickets? And if so, you know, who pays for that parking ticket? The person who parked there? That's kind of an interesting question. Um, I don't know if we could offer certain parking spaces, have like gig uh, hubs. Yeah, gig hubs. Maybe the city hall parking lot. I mean, since the city isn't really using the city hall right now. I mean, I don't know. Oh, yeah, they are a little bit. But maybe there could be some hubs that, um, that the gigs can park and we could have some public notices to say where, you know, gigs are, you could find a gig car. Um, I don't know, do they park at Sprouts? Do they park at UC Village? I don't really see gigs too many places in Albany. Um, so yeah, just a couple questions. Is it an app? Do you go on a website? Um, and also does gig offer electric cars? I think you know, we should allow gig to operate in our city if they're going to be moving toward electric in the near future. We could push gig or question them, say, hey, um, are you going to come up with some electric cars? Maybe they already do. They probably do, right? Um, so we can try to go green on that. I'm sure our climate action committee would love that. Um, and I was wondering if we could reach out to gig to sponsor one car for maybe an hour a day or an hour a week to do city business. You know, maybe the city can have a contract with gig to lease or to, to rent. I don't, is it pay by the hour or by the day? I don't know. And what kind of insurance do you need? Like, cause I have Geico. So if I drive a gig car, and I have car insurance. Do I need to pay for gigs car insurance? Like, you know, renting a car hurts. You got to pay for or renting a U-Haul. You got to pay for their insurance. Um, how does the insurance work for gig? Let's say you get in an accident driving a gig car. Because actually I saw a gig car at East Bay Tow last week. And the airbags were deployed and all this stuff. So, um, yeah, just a few questions about gig.
I don't see any other public speakers. All right, then let's bring it back to the commission for uh, comments and any other musings on the uh, gig car share. Uh, oops, I'm sorry, I got a new window popping up. Block my window. Um, Commissioner Javadal. Thank you. Um, I think lots of good questions uh, by Jeremiah and the, the website gigcarshare.com has all the answers. I won't try to answer them all uh, with the exception that yes, gig provides its own insurance. So you don't have to own a car or have car insurance to use it. Uh, and there's an app, but yeah, everything else is on their website. Commissioner Graham. I did want to follow up and ask um, what, if anything is done when, if a gig car isn't used and it stays in the same place for, you know, a long period of time, or is it just inevitable, um, inevitable <laughs> that we just wait until someone uses it again, or what's the process? So the city hasn't changed any of the rules for gig as applies to other vehicles. So it's subject to the 72 hour um, limit, like private vehicles are gig does employ folks to redistribute vehicles. So if they don't move for a while, I think they they do some of the offering discounts to try to incentivize people moving them, um, but they do have staff to move it. Some of that staff has been shifted to additional cleaning, I believe now under COVID. So there's probably less of that going on currently than there was, um, but that's how they manage it. Thank you. I would add that we, we spent a good bit of time at the beginning of, of the gig car share coming to Albany, uh, you know, taking presentations from them, talking with them about it. Uh, our regulations, our street sweeping, making sure that they could integrate their app in with our parking regulations and street sweeping to make sure that it wouldn't be an issue. And we really haven't heard on this commission, and I, I think staff can confirm that it, it's been pretty smooth in Albany. Any other commissioner comments or questions? Great. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I Please. Um, I did think that uh, the commenter's point about wondering what their plan is um, for the future to reduce greenhouse gases to go electric would be um, a great thing to know. If you could just look into that and let us know if they have any plans, because I know the state's moving um, uh, to be more um, aggressive in that area. Their vehicles currently are hybrid vehicles. They have a pilot in Sacramento that is working on with electric vehicles. They've expressed interest in here, um, partly it's the infrastructure. So they, for, for it to work for them, they're interested in more fast charging facilities in the area before they would be able to roll out that kind of thing here. But it is something we're talking with them about. Thank you. All right. Last call for commissioners' comments on this subject. Seeing none and hearing none, uh, I want to thank staff and let's move along to our next item on the agenda, which would be our consent calendar. And this time, the only item on our consent calendar is the meeting minutes. And uh, are there any, are there any, uh, do we need to pull the meeting minutes from the consent calendar? Uh, are there any comments or corrections from the commission? Um, well, it seems I'm not gonna vote yay or nay because I wasn't here, so. Great, we will ask you to abstain. Okay. And that's, that's perfectly natural, yes. And that'll happen uh, when we have absences as well. Um, I, I guess I need to um, open it up to public comment on the consent calendar. I don't see any hands raised for public comment. All right, for excuse me, for consent calendar. Okay. Um, so uh, back to the commission, Commissioner Javadal. I'm sorry. Approve. Move to approve. I need a second from the commissioners. Anyone second. can do that. I'm sorry. I, did, I see a second from Del Rosario. 
uh, all in favor of uh, approving the consent calendar, which is made up of the minutes, raise your uh, hand. But I see uh, the three of us who were present at the time have voted to approve, uh, abstaining. And the other two. And we need to have three for a, a quorum, and, and uh, we've made that. So we're good. We've approved the minutes and the consent calendar. And we can move on to our discussion and possible actions on number five. Before we leave this one, if I may to interrupt just for a second, just yeah. so for, if there's anyone listening by phone, as Commissioner McCroskey, Commissioner Javendal, and Commissioner Del Rosario voted aye, and uh, Commissioner Graham and Commissioner Fong abstained because they were not in, on the commission at the time of the vote. Just for people who may not be watching that. Absolutely. Uh, and for our, our uh, audio record that the minutes get made from. So I'll try and make that more obvious next time. Thank you. You know, I watch enough police procedural uh, dramas. I should, I should know by now, right? Right. Now, moving right along to uh, matters under discussion and possible action, we're going to talk about item 5.1, the Ohlone Greenway Trail Intersection Safety Improvements. Thank you, Vice Chair McCroskey. I'll briefly walk through the background on this project and then I'll hand it over to Allison uh, and Andrew for tonight's discussion. Uh, the 2012 Active Transportation Plan included a recommendation for striping a through and left lane on the north and southbound approaches to these intersections um, and a combination right turn only and bike through lane at the Masonic Solano and Marin uh, Masonic intersections. The striping was implemented at three of the four approaches, excluding the uh, southbound Masonic at Solano approach in the fall of 2016 in conjunction with pavement rehabilitation. The change in striping raised concerns from residents regarding motorist compliance with the new striping and increased attention on the vehicle movement conflicts with the bicycle and pedestrian traffic on the Ohlone Greenway. In 2017, the commission recommended that city council prioritize intersection improvements in the capital improvement plan, in particular recommending upgrades to the traffic signal and controller, adding protected left turns on the southbound Masonic approaches, and providing leading pedestrian intervals for the east and west crosswalks. Uh, the, in March of 2018, City Council approved the five-year capital improvement plan, which included this project for signal upgrades. In early 2019, the project was recommended for regional funding from the California Active Transportation Program and the CTC, the California Transportation Commission approved that regional recommendation at its May 2019 meeting. Uh, in June of 2019, the Transportation Commission discussed the conceptual plan alternatives for the intersection improvements. And the, this commission supported an alternative with protected left turns for both northbound and southbound Masonic Avenue traffic at the two intersections. This alternative included dedicated left turn lanes and combined through and right turn lanes for both the north and southbound approaches new signal mast arms at the north and south end of both intersections, leading pedestrian interval signal timing at each intersection for north-south crossings, and three bulb outs at Marin Masonic, along with directional curb ramps and associated with the, the left protected left turns was a 100 foot turn pocket in the southbound direction to accommodate uh, lagging left turn queuing, the, the left turn following the, the through movements, um, which would increase the red curb adjacent to the southbound approaches from the current 50 feet to 100 feet to accommodate the longer pocket. Um, and that I just wanted to run through the prior commission discussion and project elements. And with that, I'll hand it over to Allison Carrillo, who is the city's project manager on this. Hi, good evening, commissioners. Um, my name is Allison Carrillo, um, and I'm here from Public Works. I'm really happy to share progress on this project. Um, we're currently wrapping up 70% design and approaching 95% design next month. 
um, the project is on schedule to meet grant requirements uh, for allocation in April. Um, due to some ongoing coordination with the Masonic, or sorry, the Marin Paving Project, we've elected to move forward this month with only the proposed signal and striping improvements. Um, and for next month, we'll be providing the uh, civil improvements, um, including curb return, curb ramps, any bulb outs that are gonna be included under this project. Um, in March, we plan to, oh, we're shooting for March right now for the Marin paving. So you can see how the two projects integrate um, at these, this uh, intersection of Masonic and Marin. Um, let's see. And uh, with that, I think I'll um, introduce Andrew Lee. He's uh, from Parisi Transportation Consulting, who's working on the signal and striping improvements. And he'll present on the details a little bit more. Okay, thank you, Allison. Uh, good evening, Andrew Lee with Parisi Transportation Consulting. Uh, I'm gonna pull up a screen share. Uh, just by way of an uh, introduction, um, I've been working on this project for quite a while, um, working with the city on this uh, since its conception um, several years ago and assisted with the uh, grant application to ATP um, that resulted in the grant funding. And our current role right now is working on the signal design and the striping and signage plan. And we are coordinating with the civil firm on the bulb outs. So there are two intersections within this project scope. Uh, the first one that I'm gonna talk about is Marin at Masonic. Before you is a aerial photo of the existing condition at uh, Marin and Masonic and North is to your left on the screen here. Uh, the current arrangement uh, as Justin described is such that there is a combined left and through lane on the northbound and southbound approaches. Um, and a right turn lane combined with a bicycle lane uh, in the, uh, the rightmost lane on the northbound and southbound approaches. Uh, Ohlone Greenway is to the uh, top of this image uh, beneath the BART tracks that run left to right. And the next slide I'll present here is the proposal. So this is the same orientation as before. Uh, some of the things I'll call out to your attention, the most uh, significant change being that in the northbound and southbound approaches, what used to be the combined left and through lanes will be restriped as left turn pocket lanes only. And the rightmost lanes in both of those northbound and southbound approaches will become combined through and right turn lanes. Uh, due to the limitations of uh, roadway geometry, there isn't room to provide a separate bicycle lane to the right of the combined through and right lanes. Uh, however, uh, based on staff direction, we do provide green bike box queue um, storage areas um, in front of the uh, vehicle stop bar, and that is intended for people on bike, if they arrive at the intersection prior to uh, vehicles behind them, that they have a place to queue. Also serves the purpose of having vehicles not encroach into the crosswalk. And lastly, for people that are riding their bicycles uh, on Marin Avenue in the east and westbound direction, if they desire to turn left onto either leg of Masonic and yet would not want to merge into the through lanes and enter the left turn pocket, what they can do is what's sometimes referred to as a Copenhagen left turn, which means that somebody riding in a bike lane can pull into the bike queuing box and wait for the subsequent green light when their direction of Masonic uh, gets the green face. Uh, the arrangement here is limited because with the proposed ball bouts and the geometry of the crosswalks, there isn't the, the adequate space to provide a queuing area in front of the crosswalk, as you may see in other jurisdictions. Um, however, uh, we felt that uh, 
providing this queuing space was important and therefore locating it uh, behind the crosswalk uh, was deemed as a design compromise. I'll also note that the crosswalks noted here are the triple four kind. They are a high visibility striping uh, crosswalk type. And we also recommend a green treatment for the Ohlone Greenway crossing uh, on the uh, top leg of this crosswalk here. Uh, as Justin noted as well, the left turn pockets uh, and re rearrangement of the lanes means that uh, the red curb uh, located in the southbound direction uh, gets extended uh, in total to about 100 feet. Moving on to the intersection at Marin and Solano, this is the existing arrangement. Similar to Marin at Masonic in the northbound direction, it has a combined left and through lane and a right turn pocket with a bicycle lane. In the southbound direction, it has a single single lane approach with no such distinctions. Uh, the proposal at Solano is similar to what's going on at Marin with the creation of a left turn pocket, uh, which will come into play uh, when we talk about the signalization phasing changes. And due to the geometry and the arrangement of the curb ramps, at Solano, uh, you'll notice that the arrangement of the bike queue boxes for the Copenhagen left turn is different from Marin. And that's because with the existing bulb outs, there is space to locate a queuing space that is not in the path of oncoming traffic in the east and westbound directions. Uh, that space is not available on Marin, hence the, the design difference. Uh, beyond that, the uh, design for the striping here is very similar to uh, Marin with a green striping, triple four crosswalk type, and uh, advanced stop bars and red curb, uh, either extension or refreshing. From here, I'm going to touch on the signal design on a high level. I do have the detailed signal design plans if you'd like to dive into the details, but I'll just mention what some of the features are. They are common between uh, Marin and Solano at Masonic. So as noted before, uh, in the northbound and southbound directions right now, the existing phasing is that northbound and southbound traffic can go at the same time. What a person in a car will see is a, what we refer to as a green ball. Uh, that's a non-arrow type signal, which means that a person wanting to go straight has the uh, priority to do so. But if um, the driver wants to make a turn, whether right or left, they are to yield to traffic, uh, oncoming traffic, and also traffic within the crosswalks and people crossing the Ohlone Greenway. Uh, the core problem with this signal phasing arrangement, what we call permitted signal phasing, since you're permitted to turn, but you're not afforded the priority to turn, is that people uh, driving, wanting to make a turn, uh, may conflict with path users on the Ohlone Greenway, and they um, may be paying attention to oncoming drivers and perhaps not uh, paying attention to people in the crosswalk if they're making such a left turn. And so the proposal here is with the new left turn signal in the northbound and southbound directions, uh, just walking through the phase diagram here, in the beginning for the green light for the northbound direction, the rearranged signal phasing will begin first with a leading pedestrian interval indicated with this asterisk. And this is the Ohlone Greenway crossing. And so they uh, path users will get the green light, the green hand to walk first. This will be followed by a leading northbound left turn and northbound vehicle phase. And what this means is that there would not be any conflict with southbound left turns while the Ohlone Greenway crossing phase is active. This will continue until the northbound left turn phasing expires, in which case the southbound traffic uh, green light will go. However, uh, again, with a leading pedestrian interval, people in the crosswalk will get a head start of about three to five seconds uh, before southbound traffic is allowed to go. 
In this case, left turns would not be allowed. There would be a left turn arrow active in both directions. And so people driving can go through or take a right turn, provided there is no conflict within the crosswalk. And then finally, we would uh, see the conclusion of the Ohlone Greenway crossing and then the begin, beginning of a southbound left turn phase. And so in providing what we called a leading and lagging left turn phasing scheme, leading meaning that one direction is leading and the second direction is lagging the other one that they're not occurring simultaneously. Uh, there's a reason for that is that the in intersection is relatively narrow and simultaneous left turns are geometrically difficult. They are possible right now because it does occur. Um, however, uh, in having the southbound left turns uh, commence after the after the Ohlone Greenway crossing goes, uh, we won't have uh, a situation perhaps characterized as a sneaker turns where uh, somebody is trying to get through the Ohlone Greenway crossing, seeing that the pedestrian crossing time is counting down um, and conflicting with a driver in the southbound direction, seeing a yellow or a red light and having already entered the intersection, trying to make a turn before, uh, before the red phase fully occurs. And so this arrangement here is designed to reduce the conflicts, uh, particularly for people in the um, trail crossing from oncoming left turns. However, there are safety benefits afforded in both directions. Uh, I will note that we are not proposing such a treatment for the eastbound and westbound movements on Marin or Solano. And the reasons for that um, are several. There are there was a, um, a safety focus uh, just specific to the Ohlone Greenway for the grant application uh, process and also the crossing um, in the east and westbound directions is typically less trafficked uh, compared to the trail. And therefore, um, based on those limitations, that's where the uh, scope of this project um, leads us. I'll also touch on several other features um, that I can dive into if you'd like. Uh, per staff recommendation, we are designing this system to have touchless APS. These are accessible pedestrian signals. Um, you may see them as push buttons, but they also provide accessible signals in the way of either vibration, chirping, or vocal commands uh, that a crosswalk phase is on. Uh, we are integrating additional pedestrian push button posts to conform with California Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Device recommendations for push button placement or accessible pedestrian signal placement. We are upgrading the pedestrian signals to the countdown type so that you that so that you can see how much time is remaining. There are existing small signal heads, eight inch signal heads that the design will be upsizing to a, the larger 12 inch type. And resulting from all this, we are updating the signal timing uh, so that the leading pedestrian intervals and then the protected left turns are integrated um, and we will be designing the pedestrian crossing phases uh, to a lower uh, walk speed standard to accommodate a diversity of users. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to the commission for questions. Thank you for that presentation. So, uh, commissioner questions. Let's go with uh, Commissioner Fong. Thanks. Um, yeah, well, really great presentation. I'm really excited about this. Seems like you guys have done a lot of good thinking about how to keep it safe for pedestrians and bikes and also maybe a better flow for the cars. Um, so definitely excited about it. One, one question I had is about for the bikes going across the greenway, um, is there is there a, how does the light work for that? Is that a, a bike light saying that's free to cross or is it along with the pedestrian light? I'm just curious about, about that and when that's gonna happen. Do I go ahead and answer these questions or will the commission? Would, please. Okay, thanks. Uh, the the Ohlone Greenway crossing um, 
will still be controlled by a single pedestrian signal. And so uh, that's the current operation right now is uh, when there's a green hand, both people walking and on bikes are uh, provided the, the priority to, to cross. Um, we did consider a dedicated bicycle phase. Uh, however, uh, that would mean that um, the bicycle phase would be dedicated and vehicles would not be allowed to make any right or left turn movements coincident with that. And that does extend the, the signal phasing time a little bit more. And it also would provide a little bit of um, inconsistency in that if we show a red bicycle signal and yet the pedestrian crossing phase is active, then it provides mixed signals because technically somebody on bikes not supposed to enter the intersection on a red signal. And so for matters of simplicity and just understanding that um, there's a very diverse number of users on the pathway, we decided to keep it um, per the existing configuration. Thanks. Other commissioner, uh, yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, I think actually uh, Commissioner Del Rosario had his hand up earlier. Did you get your question answered? Uh, partly, um, Andrew, um, I was wondering if you can walk through some of the, the, the bike movements. Um, so I know before um, say going uh, north-south on Masonic, um, there was that little um, Q, Q lane for the, for the bikes and that, that goes away. And then we have the bike box in place. So um, cyclists, um, I think can still travel in the curbside lane on the left side of the vehicles to get up to the bike box. Is that correct? And then there they get a, a head start to whether make a left turn or go or go straight or make or a right turn. I'll go ahead and share my screen just so uh, we're all looking at the same thing. Um, right now under existing conditions, there is a shared right turn only slash bike lane in, I think both directions. And because of space limitations, we weren't able to fit in a full sized bike lane. And so uh, for somebody using Masonic, uh, if they happen to arrive first. This is the dedicated bicycle queuing space. If they happen to arrive behind a vehicle, uh, their options are to wait behind the vehicle or uh, if so afforded the space, they could sneak around it and there would still be a queuing space. Um, this doesn't necessarily conform to the recommended uh, design for bike boxes, which is to provide a, a small uh, section of bike lane uh, to let people on bike get ahead of vehicles. Um, but that's a, a bit of a limitation of the geometry that we weren't able to, to provide that bike lane. So it's a, sorry, a follow-up question. There. So is the 13 foot um, curbside lane, then I, I guess why, why couldn't we fit the, the, the bike queue lane in there still? Um, and is it because there's two movements now, or so cars can queue next to each other. Um, Cause 13 is, I guess, we don't want to get down to a 10 foot line, right? And we need like a four foot facility. Is that the, is that the, we're missing a foot? Uh, we're actually missing two feet. Uh, the standard for a bike lane is, it can be four feet if there isn't a raised curb, but it needs to be five feet if there is a curb. Okay. So then the, 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 the previous, the current condition is, is substandard. Uh, the current condition, it's a dashed lane. And so it's, uh, it's technically more of a shared facility, I believe. Let me see. It's, you can notice here on the image that it is a dashed lane. And so that is allowed as a shared facility within within a right turn lane. And it's also designed this way because uh, for a right turn only lane, a person on bike proceeding through is supposed to be to the left of the vehicle and not to the right of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we could, however, clarify the current design with uh, shared lane uh, markings or sharrows if desired. Um, that would indicate, however, again, that a person on bike 
would be expected to queue behind a vehicle if they arrive uh, second. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Commissioner Graham. Um, thank you. Andrew, if we could see the screen again, actually, because I had a similar question about, I mean, I was going to suggest we should consider Sharrows because I believe there are Sharrows um, to the north and south on Masonic as well. So I would think that it would be good to be consistent. But then I had a question as to why the bike queuing, I understand that the geometry means that it can't be in front of the crosswalk here as it is at, at Solano. But what is the, why is it um, two lanes wide here and not two lanes wide at the Solano intersection? And then also the bike signal is only showing that it's that Copenhagen left rather than the just a, the same orientation as it is here. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if I may try to clarify a little bit on uh, the commissioner's question, why is it that the bike box arrangement differs between Marin and Solano? Uh, for one, at Marin, uh, we do have the bike box arrangement in front, and it serves a dual purpose. For one, it allows a person on bike to pull in and, from uh, Marin if they choose to make the Copenhagen left. And because it's recessed behind the crosswalk, we saw that it needed a bit more space for somebody to make that movement because they would be crossing and trying to turn at a relatively sharp angle because of the um, the way the arrangement of the, the crosswalk and the and the stop bar is. Uh, second is that we want to maintain consistency as to where the stop bar or the, the stop line marking for oncoming traffic in the northbound and, and southbound directions are. And so uh, it's not desirable to have uh, a vehicle in one lane stop in front of the other. Uh, in particular, generally not preferred to have left turning vehicles um, set in front uh, near the crosswalk because when there are vehicles making the left turn uh, from the east and westbound directions, uh, the turn is tight. And so uh, setting the left turning vehicles back a bit more uh, consistent with uh, the through vehicles uh, affords turning vehicles from Marin to make the um, movement with a little bit more space, especially because we're also proposing ball bouts at the southwest and northeast and actually also at the southeast corners. But, oh. Yeah, go ahead. So if you're going to continue, that would be great. Sure. Um, it contrasts this with Solano, the geometry and the arrangement of the curb ramps is such that there is a curbed area that provides a refuge of sorts for people on bike. Uh, I'll note that on Marin, for instance, that there are bus stops here. And so for uh, somebody uh, wanting to make the Copenhagen left and being slightly in the path of travel for a bus pulling into the bus stop would be uh, uncomfortable. And so this arrangement also provides that additional uh, separation from the oncoming uh, traffic uh, related to buses. Uh, this condition doesn't quite exist due to the existing bulb outs on Solano Ave and also with where the crosswalks are arranged. And similarly, because the crosswalks are arranged and uh, where they are, uh, setting the vehicles back uh, was not identified as, as quite a pronounced need because the left turns here would already have uh, the extra room uh, compared to how um, Moraine is arranged. Uh, that all makes sense, but I guess uh, my question is why the in on the Marin intersection, the even though it's whether or not it's before or after the crosswalk, it's 
to it's both it's the width of both of the lanes the left and the straight and right and i think while the assumption while you're planning for the copenhagen left which is great i hope we all take advantage of it i think that the people that are traveling northbound and southbound are going to also be using that as a queuing space for the protected left if they're there um, before the vehicles so in the north or in the solano intersection, then it appears that you're not uh, encouraging the bike to take advantage of that sort of the bike queuing sort of in front of the cars. And I guess um, I think that, frankly, that's more of the use that would come of these bike queue boxes than these Copenhagen lefts, at least until we all go and visit Copenhagen and come back and start doing that. That was a joke, but anyway. It's hard so to I guess my reason. question is what is there a reason because of the geometries are such that the it's not um, the width of both of the lanes in, in this intersection? Yeah, it's not the width of both the lanes. Well, you know what, to your point, I think that we could make this Copenhagen left box the width of both the lanes. It would not materially um, affects its operation. So I can certainly take that as council direction under consideration if that's what you'd like to see. That would be my suggestion. I'd love to hear what the other commissioners have to say. And then adding to that, I would also like to hear what people would have to say about the addition of the Sharrows back um, in the northbound and the north and right hand turn lane. And that I'm those are my comments. Great. So, uh, Commissioner Graham, we're we're going to hold off on uh, commissioner comments and and opinions on those two things for now, uh, before we go uh, until after we go to public comment. Um, we we try and ask our questions now. It it takes a while to get in the rhythm of this, so no problem. I will try to remember to bring those both back up, and we're, if I don't, please remind me. Okay. I will certainly do that. Great. Thanks. Um, I, I'm going to jump in here because I had a related question, Andrew, um, and thank you also for the presentation, clear as always. Um, back on the um, Solano Masonic intersection at the southwest corner, uh, the curb cut area there, um, we had some discussions, and maybe this is a question for staff, we had some discussions about uh, possibly moving that curb cut closer into the line of travel. And uh, there was a, a curb cut project on Solano that uh, was going to be redoing curb cuts. And uh, I'm wondering if staff uh, knows if that curb cut is actually gonna be moving northward. So the other curb cut project was, I don't, know the, I guess, direct answer to what you're asking. There is another curb ramp project that's addressing most of the curb ramp upgrades at Solano and Masonic. The, this project is, we're gonna bring civil next month, is gonna address, I think, one corner that's not in that project, but the others are gonna be covered under that existing separate project. It just affects the geometry of the crosswalk and this issue of where the, the bike refuge is is the only reason I, I ask. So maybe that, that's something to, to look into before we talk about it again. Um, before I, I, I usually go last as the chair, uh, are there other commissioner questions? I'm not seeing any, be verbal if I'm missing you. Great. Um, so I have a couple questions. Um, these, um, at least the Solano intersection has been on automatic recall, I believe. Is the intention to switch to, to button call? So we did uh, get direction from staff that with the, we are upgrading the traffic signal controller at Solano, which will provide some additional abilities um that 
aren't afforded with the current controller. Uh, we also did submit uh, draft signal timing, uh, which was getting reviewed by Alameda County, who services your traffic signals. And the current programming scheme is to have recall for all four pedestrian crossing phases during daytime hours at least. Uh, the plan currently has it between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. Uh, this is certainly adjustable. Uh, it could go to um, all times of day. Um, there are various uh, advantages and disadvantages, uh, of course. Um, and so we certainly have the flexibility to um, to to change the, the phasing, but at least right now the, the daytime uh, operations are such that recall is, uh, is extended throughout the day. Great. Um... I'm also curious to know if you considered or, or are including uh, visual feedback, um, especially at Marin and Masonic, of the, uh, you know, the, the call button being pressed. Mm. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's something that I've, I've seen in other jurisdictions. They're, they're, sometimes it's a, a, a yellow box around the walk signal that just lets you know that, yes, your, your call has been received. This is an intersection where people come up at uh, that particular intersection at Marin and Masonic, where people come up to it at very different speeds. And if there's a scrum of pedestrians who, who are gathered and I, I come up on a bike uh, with that kind of visual feedback, I wouldn't have to force my way in and try and push the button or try and communicate or any of those things. Um, and it, it would allow a little more information, a little more separation. So regarding so there's definitely one thing that we are incorporating to, into the design that will address part of that issue which is that the current arrangement of the pedestrian push buttons isn't optimal sometimes it's on the left and sometimes it's on the right um, and per the california mutcd recommendations we are uh, arranging the new aps's so that they are in the direction of the of the Ohlone Greenway's uh, path of travel. So if you're going northbound, the button will be on your right so that if you're on a bike, for instance, you're not gonna have to cross into opposing traffic. And likewise, in the opposite direction, it'll generally be on a, a person's right. Um, re related to the accessible pedestrian signal equipment, uh, most equipment out there does have a visual indicator however it's a relatively small led like red light that you may have seen uh, if we receive direction from the council uh, or commission excuse me uh, for slightly different equipment we can certainly write that into the equipment specifications and it would be uh, up to the uh, it would be up to us, the designer, to, to, to point to a type of equipment manufacturer that would meet those needs. So we can certainly integrate that into the design. Okay, great. Uh, I think my last question is, is there a, a communication plan, both on the ground for when the signal is changed uh, for motorists and pedestrian cyclists approaching the intersection, because uh, we're changing lanes and, and uh, you know, reconfiguring and, and also changing the, the sequencing. And is there a, a communication plan uh, for uh, all residents to let them know if there's a change? Maybe I can turn that over to Justin. Yeah, our public work staff was was out for that question. Um, yes, we, we, we had a little bit of a power issue here at the public works building and it knocked some of our uh, computers <laughs> off. And so we're, we're trying to get back on can I call public works? Yeah. I just hope you're not flooded out. No, no, we're fine. We're all oh, good. Uh, the the question was regarding communication plan for for the for the changes. So that's that's something that we haven't asked the consultants to do, but that's something that community development and public works can definitely have prepared before construction begins. Great. So um I Commissioner Fong. Can I just clarify um, what you were asking um, Andrew about the, the recall? So you're saying between six and 10, it's gonna be automatic pedestrian light lights. Is that, is, that what, is, that, is, that, is that what you're saying with the recall? Okay, just wanna make sure I understood that right. Thanks. That's all. All right. Are there any other commissioner questions? 
then uh, let's turn it over to Jeff to bring in public comment. I see some hands. Yes, we have uh, three speakers so far, four. Uh, first, uh, Samantha uh, Pipkin, you may begin. Um, looks like Samantha, you're using an older version of Zoom that won't let me bring you in to speak. Um, so I'm gonna temporarily bring you up as a panelist. So you'll be on the screen for a moment and uh, then you'll be able to address the commission. Oh, uh, please unmute yourself. Thank you, hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Great, thanks, sorry about that. Um, so I live at the intersection of uh, uh, Masonic and uh, Solano, been here for about 14 years. I'm, I'm looking at the intersection now, I do every day when I look out the window of my front um, yard, I, of my front window. I would like to thank the commission and uh, Mr. Lee and the city for their efforts to try to improve the safety of these intersections. It's much appreciated. Um, I see a lot of things being done to improve the safety in the north-south direction. I'm concerned that there may be unintended consequences to the safety in the east-west direction, which doesn't really, I'm not really seeing anything done to improve the safety, particularly for pedestrians in the east-west direction. I would certainly encourage the city to consider ways that the east-west pedestrian safety can be protected. Um, through this project, if not directly, um, maybe by planning for the future in such a ways. My biggest concern would be the um, left-hand turn lane on Solano Avenue when you're going in the westbound direction that turns southbound on the Masonic Avenue. Um, you know, that, that left-hand pocket lane's been there a long time. People love to try to gun it to see if they can beat everybody through there. It's a daily occurrence. Um, and I've, I've been in the crosswalk when that happened and had to get real, had the cars get real close to me. And I've seen it out my window numerous times as well. So I, I understand the Ohlone Greenway is, you know, a higher traffic level, probably. I'm assuming you have data that um, backs that up. Um, but the crosswalks in the other direction are heavily used as well. And unfortunately, if you create the illusion of more safety in one, if you create more safety in one direction with the left-hand turn pockets, you're likely to create the illusion of more safety in the opposite direction, which could only potentially um, increase the uh, potential for um, collisions with pedestrians in the uh, east-west bound um, uh, crosswalks. So uh, lastly, I just wanted to note that uh, I heard um, Commissioner Graham's comment about the um, green boxes and potentially um, spreading them across both lanes and um, as a bicyclist and a person who is in that intersection a lot, I, I would certainly um, support that. I could see an argument in both directions, but that, that would be my preference as well. So just one extra vote for that. Um, so thank you for considering this. Obviously there's always a, an economy of scale that happens whenever you're doing a construction project and we always wanna make everything safer and not have any of those unintended side effects much like what happened in the project in 2016, which in a lot of ways actually made the intersection more dangerous than it was prior. Um, so thank you for listening. Great, thank you. Bear with me while I switch over to our next speaker. Um, Amy Smolens, please go ahead. Okay, unmute. Hi, happy new year guys um, and ladies, people. Um, when I bike on the Greenway, it's definitely sketchy um, when you're crossing Marin and Solano and there's always a danger of being um, right or left hooked. Um, sometimes I'll even ride on Masonic, take the lane just to avoid that hazard. And when I drive, I avoid turning from Masonic onto Marin or Solano and take other cross streets. Um, so I definitely think the, uh, the signal changes um, will help um, will help people on the uh, on the greenway having the uh, the lead the uh, the leading phase um, I think that it would be good though if the signal if the signal with the leading phase did have a bike and ped light simultaneous so there's clarity there's a lot of inexperienced cyclists a lot of families kids 
And I think they'd want to know, be sure that, yep, it's their, it's their turn to proceed across so they won't miss the, uh, miss the leading phase. Um, I agree with Commissioner Graham about having the, the bike box with the left turn on Solano and about Sharrows. I think both of those were enhanced safely, safety. Um, also wondering, have you considered um, warning lights or signs, you know, blinking lights and signs to uh, warn the drivers that there are cyclists and pedestrians um, crossing on the greenway. You, we have those in, in Emeryville and Berkeley and El Cerrito on the Ohlone Greenway and other path, other um, bike paths and multi-use paths. And it, it definitely enhances safety. Those warning lights definitely let them know that, that we're coming and have the, uh, and they'll watch out for us. Um, also wondering if you can remove, there are these small stop signs on the Greenway crossing Solano and Marin. And I think they're confusing and they don't make sense because they conflict with the green signal. And if now you're gonna have a leading, a leading phase for cyclists and pedestrians, it's basically gonna cause the cyclist to miss the leading phase and and they're then they're going to right they're going to be with they're going to have the uh, the chance of being right hooked and left hooked again. So they're not they're going to lose their leading phase because they're going to slow down at that at that little stop sign, which really is meaningless and conflicts with the uh, with the green light. Also, just one point, I guess it's for your next project, the curb ramp project. There's there's no curb ramp on the south side of Marin and the Greenway crossing Masonic. And that's the only curb ramp that's missing. And we need that so people on strollers can can cross Masonic or people who are who are biking um, will end up can uh, can get onto Masonic from the Greenway. So right now we have to pop down the curb. Thank you very much. Thanks for this project. And it's definitely going to enhance safety. I appreciate it. You're on mute, Jeff. Thank you. This is Jeremiah. Yes, go ahead, Jeremiah. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, a couple of things. Are any of these intersections on the safe routes to school uh, map? I know in Albany, we've got strollers and rollers, or I mean, we've got safe routes to school and suggested suggested bike path and suggested ways to get to um, suggested ways to get to school. I'm just wondering if, if any of these are on the master plan for safe routes to school and on these intersections, what are we doing for making it safe for kids? Um, <clears throat> I mean, on these intersections, you know how there's like a pedestrian crossing sign. It's a high visibility green or yellow um, with a person walking. I mean, maybe we can put up one of those so that way cars can see, wow, there's this big high visibility neon pedestrian crossing sign. Maybe there's people crossing there, you know? but all these intersections look so gray and dull around the five foot, six foot height area. <clears throat> so, I mean, I would suggest pedestrian crossing signs. I mean, all up and down Solano, we don't have one pedestrian crossing sign on any of the crosswalks on Solano. Um, do you remember Jeff, a few years ago when I was talking about San Pablo you know, kids crossing the schools, kids live on Albany Hill and they got across San Pablo to go to school and there were no high visibility crosswalk signs in Albany. And then you guys probably thought it was a good idea. And then I remember the next couple months, now there's all these high visibility crosswalk signs on San Pablo. <laughs> I mean, it's great. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would put up, put more push button LED crosswalks. You know, you push a light. I did see the one on Marin and Talbot. That's great. I've seen it being used. And pedestrian safety is number one. I mean, I don't want to see next month you have a traffic collision 
report and someone got ran over on this intersection. That would just be terrible. The last thing I want to say was about striping uh, between Gilman and Dartmouth on Masonic. There's no middle lane between uh, Gilman and Dartmouth. Yeah, on Masonic. There's no yellow line in the middle of the street. So maybe you could try to restripe that street. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Jeremiah. And uh, next, Peter, please go ahead. Yeah, I have a simple question. Um, yeah, this, this is a good plan from, from what I can see. I, I, when I was commuting, I would, I would go through both of those intersections every day. But um, I would like to know what is the length of the cycle, the full cycle now, and what would it be according to this new suggested plan? And also, when you're arriving at a red light, as soon as the light turns red, how long do you have to wait for it to turn green if you're on Masonic or if you're on Marin or Solano? And I yield my time. Thank you very much. I don't see any other speakers. Jeff, you didn't say the gentleman yields his time. <laughs> Sorry. Great. Seeing no other speakers, we'll bring it back to the commission. And um, would anybody like to get started with uh, further questions, bring up issues that came up from the public or uh, stating opinions? I should say and statement. Should we go back to uh, Commissioner Graham? Great. Um, well, I guess I did have a question following on um, Samantha's comment, which was uh, if there has been any thought to the improvements on the east um, and west. I think if I'm understanding the comment, it was maybe uh, suggesting the need for a protected left turn from um, westbound Sorry, I have a really hard time with directions, uh, which is hard for this commission. Westbound Solano onto Masonic. Um, South, onto southbound Masonic. Thank you. So that, I guess, is a question to staff. Or Andrew. Or Andrew. I don't have total recall of the conceptual level discussion of the commission, but I, I believe it did come up at least at one point. Um, but the the main justification as Andrew walked through was the real two considerations that really prompted this project were the issues that were brought up with the restriping in 2016 and the need for signal upgrades to really do the re the reverse option of providing the, the safety of the, the turn bay to the, le and the left and the through and right. Um, and so it was really a north and southbound issue uh, as well as the priority of the greenway safety. Um, so that's that's why that those movements elevated to the top. Um, it would of course be cost and expansion of scope to, to do additional additional approaches. I guess the question then, I guess, in terms of process would be, I think certainly it's understood that um, the scope of this work has already been identified, but to look into the future needs, um, what is the process? I'm asking for my own education, if we'd like you to look into the comments um, uh, is, and or I guess, determine if it's something that should be addressed in a future capital improvement project. It would be through uh, additional sort of citywide, I think, prioritization. So in a active transportation plan update discussion or future capital improvement planning um, discussion would be, I think the places, the other, the other avenue, I think, would be um, the Solano Complete Streets project, which this is the western bound of that. So I think it is something that could be revisited um, 
when we do more planning work for that. Okay. I can, however, offer that um, because we're upgrading the signal controller that we can also program in a leading pedestrian interval for the east and west, uh, well, the north and south crosswalks as well. And we can certainly extend the leading interval time uh, in order to facilitate people crossing. Uh, and one thing to also note is with the geometry of Solano that uh, if we do add uh, protected left turns, it would only be in the westbound direction because in the eastbound direction, there's only one approach lane. So something to, to note. And then on that point though, could you also uh, answer the final question about the time the overall time of this signal? Yeah, right now I'm gonna be speaking in some generalities here because the signal phasing isn't hard set, uh, hard coded um, to a set cycle time. It does react to um, the demand and traffic, but uh, I'd say right now it's around between 60 and 70 seconds uh, with the two phase operation. And with the addition of the leading pedestrian intervals and the protected left turns, it's probably going to be somewhere in the 90 to 100 second range. Um, and that will be relatively consistent, especially because we're recommending pedestrian recall during daytime hours. Um, right now, if you were to run it without pedestrian recall, uh, during some phases, they could be shorter than the 30 or so seconds that would be needed for somebody to walk um, through the through the crosswalk and a phase could be um, uh, terminated early, but uh, with pedestrian recall, uh, the incidental delay to people driving would be a little bit more um, in order to ensure uh, adequate pedestrian crossing time on every cycle, on every leg. Okay, and then just to finish up, I guess I would like to suggest and also would like to hear what the other commissioners have to say about the addition of the sharrows and then extending the bike queue box to be the width of the both lanes, assuming that it works with the geometries. And I'm done with my comments. Great. Who's next? Shavadol? Um, yeah, I think Shero's on Masonic sound great in the through lane. Um, see no problems with that. Um, on the, the bike box at Solano, um, I guess I, I'm just trying to think if I've seen a a double wide bike box in front of the crosswalk and why that might be it might just be encouraging bikes to cross the crosswalk while pedestrians at a green walk signal could create conflicts um, the other thing that kind of matches up with something else that andrew said was um, having that setback for when you have the westbound or eastbound left turns if you've got bikes stopped in front of the crosswalk in the left lane they're going to be in the path of the turning vehicles um, so I want to be really careful about that if, if we want to consider that as a change. Um, the other thing that Amy mentioned about the stop signs on the Greenway, I, I, stop signs have no place being in the same intersection as a traffic signal. It really ought to go away. Um, it might make sense to put a yield to pedestrian sign there because you're still crossing a sidewalk, but I certainly favor removing the stop signs. Um, and I appreciated Andrew's suggestion of a leading pedestrian interval for pedestrians crossing Masonic. I get that a left turn phase would be a whole lot more capital cost, but the LPI uh, seems like a good start. That's it for my comments. Thank you. Great. Who's next? Del Rosario. Yeah, I also um, agree with Andrew's uh, suggestion on the the uh, leading pedestrian phase um, um, for crossing a uh, Masonic. So that that should help address the public comment. Um, Cheryl's uh, for sure. Um, the 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 bike boxes are 
so as I can see the, the, the benefit of, of the bike box in front of the left turn to try to take advantage of the left turn signal. Um, I don't know if there's a way to, to design that, that it doesn't cross the whole lane or it steps back a little bit and it's smaller so that it can accommodate uh, cars turning um, left onto Masonic. Um, but it seems like it would have some advantage to, to be able to make turn movements. Um, otherwise, I think you'll be making, well, I guess you could still make the turning movement from the, from the right lane, but it'd be nice to get in front of those, the, the, the cars and know that, that the cars can see you in front of them if you're going to make that turning movement. So I don't know if there's a, some kind of modified design for that. Great. Um, Commissioner Fong? Yeah. yeah, I think I'm um, mostly in agreement here about some of these stop topics. You know, I think, um, yeah, increasing the size of that bike box. I mean, I think it would be nice to have some sort of maybe space for the left turn from the, for the bikes. Um, but yeah, if we can make it, make sure it's safe for the left turns, you know, if I'm sure they're not hit by a car, that would be nice. Um, but I think if I were to be trying to bike, it would, I, would I would like to have that. I think that would feel safe to me. Um, yeah, and I'm in favor of the leading um, pedestrian signal for the other direction as well, going east, west, I guess. Uh, yeah, for cars going more pedestrians um, for the other direction. Um, so yeah, that, those are my thoughts. Great. I've, I'm in agreement with what I've heard to uh, you know, removal of stop signs and uh, trying to come up with a pedestrian leadoff phase in the near term at Solano Masonic. Uh, that's uh, certainly on the, the southern leg there of the intersection. We, we've had at least one injury in the last 10 years, I think, 10, 12 years of, of conflict between a motor vehicle and a child. Um, I, it's interesting. I, I think of these intersections very differently you know, this is a very different environment and we're, we're looking at them very similarly here, which is interesting. And I, I think it mostly works, but it's it's um, that the pedestrian traffic east west is a lot stronger on Solano. And um, I, I think we just got to keep that in mind, uh, but I'm sure you have. Um, I have a different perception personally of the difference in the what I consider a bike box which is the, you know, the, the, the uh, refuge areas. And I, I understand wanting to make them a, the same across the intersection, but at the same time, um, as, as an, as a user who's, uh, on Masonic, you're actually more experiencing the two, uh, intersections in your lane as you go through. And those are very different. Um, and I wonder if they're, you know, what the weighting should be between those, whether it's more important to have the intersection opposite boxes agree or to have the boxes be consistent as you go through intersections. I hope that makes sense. Um, and I, I also worry about uh, the balance between, you know, left turning cars from westbound Solano to southbound Masonic and, and trying to fit the boxes in there. Um, th there are a couple issues that we brought up about, you know, who uses what signal and, and this is kind of one of them. I mean, um, you know, once you put a refuge in, that really is a strong signal that, that, uh, cyclists can be in front of motor vehicles. And if the box only covers half the lane, that's not as strong a signal. And I worry a little bit about that. Um, also, uh, Amy brought up the, you know, the fact that uh, the um, the pedestrian signals along the greenway are not specifically identifying bicycles. I we haven't come up with a language of bike signals in Albany, and I'm I'm not suggesting that we put them in here, um, but maybe, you know, if there are signs supporting that pedestrian crossing, maybe there, you know, there's some added explicitness for bicycles or a way to include a, a bike on top of the walk sign that signals that it's, it's for cyclists as well. Um, I, I saw a hand go up. Um, so that there are just some of these issues that I, 
I see as being a little bit in flux and, and need to be hacked at, hashed through. But in general, it seems like it's going in a good direction. So, Commissioner Graham. All right, I just wanted to clarify one thing about the bike queuing. Um, I guess uh, I would also encourage you to also try to do sort of a cost benefit analysis of, of is really what we're trying to encourage this Copenhagen protected left turn or is it the queuing in front of and the comfort of the um, bicycles on north south on Masonic because I guess there could also be in regards to any of the sort of things that Andrew you pointed out in terms of the having the person be out there because of the geometry then maybe there is a reason to have it be remain behind the crosswalk. So I don't think we need to answer that now, but I think it's, I guess my suggestion was also to consider what is the utility we're trying to get from the bike boxes? Is it this Copenhagen or is it the protected or, you know, the, the northbound? So that's all. Yeah, and I, I guess I was assuming that it's, it's mostly north-south traffic and and added benefit of Copenhagen turns, but uh, staff correct me if, if that's not the general assumption. Uh, Commissioner Graham, could you lower your hand? I think you have to click it again. Thank you. So um, I believe we were we were charged with uh, sharing our thoughts on this and not coming up with any kind of resolution. Um, are there any last thoughts uh, before we uh, hand this back off to staff and? and uh, not seeing any. I'm going to thank staff and, and Andrew and, and Allison for bringing this to us and um, entertaining all our questions. And with that, I'm sorry, I'm switching screens. We're going to move on to item number five, two, which is not coming up on my screen very quickly, but ah, the update to the City of Albany traffic calming policy. I'm not sure uh, who's presenting this. Thank you, Vice Chair Mikrowski. This item is a continuation of uh, discussion from the December 2020 meeting. Let me just pull one more thing up. Hold on. Hold on. So uh, just to, re to review, um, the December 2020 meeting was a discussion with a presentation from a subcommittee that was looking at uh, a shift in the threshold criteria related to our uh, evaluation of traffic coming requests. That's a, currently a resident driven process for requesting traffic coming on a particular block. The current criteria include volume threshold of under 3,000 uh, daily vehicles and a speed threshold that's called the 85th percentile speed. Um, the 85th percentile speed is a bit of a confusing concept to, to communicate, uh, but essentially maps out all the, the vehicles traveling at all their speeds and that's the particular speed where 85% of the vehicles are traveling slower than that speed and 15% are traveling faster. Um, we took a look at the speed surveys across uh, the city and it's a little difficult to read but there really has been a push over time at the commission to, to look at speed at blocks that are under that 30 mile per hour current threshold. Uh, the previous revision to the policy included a, an additional soft treatment uh, approach to, to uh, additional blocks that were in the 28 to 30 mile per hour, 85th percentile, and several recommendations from the commission have included blocks that are, that are below the 30 mile per hour for hard treatment as well. Um, so in the fall, the a subcommittee was established to look at a way to better associate 
our evaluation with the, the risk associated with speeding vehicles um, and took a, a look at calculating risk with regards to, to pedestrian injuries in particular, uh, looking at the likelihood of a collision the, times the likelihood of a, a severe pedestrian injury resulting from that collision um, and took a review of a sample of traffic surveys, looked at how it, these came out in terms of the 85th percentile speed, what actions were recommended from the commission um, and calculated a, a risk score associated with this. And one of the findings was that actually just looking at the number of vehicles going over 25 miles per hour uh, was strongly correlated with this calculated risk. Um, it was mapped out as you know extremely strong correlation. So rather than going through the more complicated analysis, we could use the number of vehicles going over 25 miles per hour as a proxy for that risk. Um, using risk prioritizes higher volume streets and it does produce uh, different results than prior actions by the commission. Uh, as I mentioned though, several of the recommendations were not just following the 85th percentile, but it took into account um, more details with different blocks and the concerns raised by residents associated with, with their concerns. So in the policy, draft policy update uh, provided to the commission, I'll run through the changes briefly um, and the steps involved in the process associated with that, that we didn't really talk through in the December 2020 meeting. Um, with the initial request, uh, I'm proposing eliminating the two-stage signature gathering that's in the current. Currently, there's an initial petition uh, and then a second petition um, that has a higher threshold. Uh, this would just be based on, which has been the current practice of, of doing the traffic surveys once uh, an initial request is made. With uh, step two, um, there would be a review of the, that the, the block in question meets some physical condition criteria. Uh, in this one, proposing to add, uh, instead of volume, as will be discussed a little more, a road classification or truck route condition and placing that here in the sort of initial screening. And I moved the special circumstances stances language from step three here. Uh, it was sort of spelled in a, out in a few different places in terms of engineering judgment associated with the evaluation. Um, as I mentioned briefly in the staff memo, one possibility that was discussed in place of, of the volume in terms of what streets would qualify uh, what would be to use the roadway classification established in the Albany General Plan uh, and would not allow petition driven requests for major arterials, which would be Buchanan, San Pablo, Marin and Solano. Uh, the truck routes uh, would be Cleveland, uh, Spur of Buchanan and at the Marin Merge and bus routes would, would then include Pier Street to, to this. For step three, uh, this is where it implements the shift away from the 85th percentile and just uh, references a, a prioritization score based on the average weekday daily volume of vehicles traveling over the speed limit. Uh, it does eliminate that maximum volume. Um, and the staff report does mention the potential issue associated with traffic diversion of remo removing this volume cap. Uh, while the risk analysis shows the direct link of risk and volume. So there is that tension there. Um, the main impact is really on the minor arterial and collector streets that have some of those volumes over 3,000 daily and that now would both qualify and rank highly in this kind of scoring. Um, the staff member also mentioned a minimum volume might also be appropriate here, uh, something on the order of 500 vehicles a day was proposed in the, in the memo. 
this step four is the first time it would then be brought into the before the transportation commission um this would be the first look at the commission uh, with the prioritized list and would entail reviewing the new traffic survey, survey data and how the new streets fit into the existing project prioritization list. A second element of this would really be when to proceed into design for these projects. Uh, staff has discussed with the commission previously, our goal here is for the process to better coincide with project delivery. Uh, the aim is to design a sufficient number of projects so that there's a queue ready to deliver, but not so many that it causes unnecessary frustration. Um, so the staff memo proposed a number something like two times the annual budgeted amount for traffic calming as a, as a place to safely have a, a pool of projects ready, um, but not have so many that there's a lot of, a lot of blocks that have seen a completed design approved and are, are, are waiting. Uh, another factor that could recommend design for a project is upcoming repaving projects, as this is a mechanism to deliver traffic coming projects caught in a cost effective fashion. Um, so this might reinforce having a minimum volume threshold, so something very low on the priority list wouldn't be in the mix. Um, when it was discussed as something that would be low and likely to stay low on the list and not move forward. If we're doing it opportunistically, we wanna be clear which ones would move forward, uh, which ones the commission direction would not be. So uh, a minimum volume threshold might be a way to get at that. Step five pulls together the design development and the block petition process. Um, and then step six is bringing me back to the commission for a review of that project design. Uh, the language in the existing policy that references bringing it to city council. Uh, generally, more recently, we've been bringing projects to city council as part of the project delivery once there, it's basically showing a design and approval for a release to bid to, to council. So I removed that from, from this stage here in the draft. And then step seven reiterates to you know, the public that it's utilizing the policy, that delivery is not on a, a set schedule and res also reserves the language that there could be cause for removal. Uh, but it took out some of the, the details on doing collection on parallel streets since that hasn't been an issue raised in commission discussion and it hasn't been data that's been collected for a while. So the one other element that should be mentioned here is what actions, uh, how actions dealt with under the existing policy, previous actions, and the, what I would be proposing here is that prior approval projects remain in the queue for project delivery as we just discussed at the commission at the last meeting. Um, and it would be open to allowing new requests from blocks not approved under the existing policy because the evaluation has changed at this point. But that's another point to, to discuss. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll highlight a few of the questions raised in, in this for, for discussion uh, and open it up for questions. Great. Thank you, that was, that was uh, very clear. Um, commission questions on the information you've just seen and the policy in general. <laughs> Commissioner Del Rosario. Sure, I had a, a few. Um, Justin, thanks for the, for the presentation. That was that was good uh, and, and clear. Um, although I do need, I have some some clarifications. So so my understanding is that. The current projects in the queue are going to stay in that queue and stay in whatever order that is. And then the new projects that we will about or that come to the to um, the city uh, will be evaluated and then follow the new criteria. And so they'll just follow they'll they'll fall in place depending on on um, the volume of vehicles um, over the speed limit. And then that will be the list. Is that correct? Um, is there, I think I asked this last time, I'm just, I just have a bad memory, um, but 
Um, is there a, a different process for um, streets that have a, a collision history? We don't have a separate traffic calming, non-petition based process. We do have um, say, uh, sort of active transportation, safety improvement priority, you know, uh, other mechanisms for developing projects um, that could address collision review. We do review collision data annually with the commission. Um, so that's a good question. This is focused on resident petitions. Um, we haven't, I don't think, we haven't discussed whether collision history should weigh in on this risk prioritization in some fashion. Uh, we, we discussed in December just the, the volume numbers as a proxy for risk, but you're right, uh, collision history would be another, another indicator that there is a, a higher risk that we didn't discuss previously. So that's not in what's proposed, but open to discussing how we might incorporate that. I'd be curious to hear how the other commissioners. Um, I I don't know how you quantify to to include that either. So curious to hear the other the other thoughts about that. Um, let's see my other questions. Um, you put in the forty fifth forty foot width um, maximum. Um, how does that compare to? I think Portland and Washington are wide wide streets, um, you know, particularly by the park or Washington where there's the, the bike lanes on each side. How does that compare to those two streets? Yeah, I was checking on that because it was just carrying over the, the old criteria. Uh, looking at the street info data I have, it would qualify for those west of where they expand uh, sort of at Pomona or whatever. Um, so west of there, I think they're 40 foot width streets and east of there is where they would expand beyond that threshold okay yes okay i'll, I'll save my my uh comments for later um two other questions um one is um i think our queue is pretty long today and how does that compare today with our budget annual budget versus um what you're proposing which is um, um double the available budget I would guess that we're probably in that similar range now. I think we have in the queue still more than like the annual budget, I think is 70,000 or something. I think delivering the projects currently in the queue would be more than that. So it might be in the, in the two year or so range would be my guess. Okay. And then, sorry, one final question is, um, um, you mentioned something about uh, COVID preventing traffic surveys. Is that staff resources that's um, preventing that or is there something else related to the pandemic? Uh, it's both, it's affecting volumes as well and traffic behavior. So a lot of the behavior around school, pick up and drop off and, and volumes associated with that is, is not in place. Um, so it's been both a point of comparison with older data and how useful that is as well as staffing resources. So we, we hadn't done any, we were interested in doing some this fall and just weren't able to um, staffing wise. So we may do another crack at it in spring as volumes have gone up, but again, it's still a different traffic behavior. And so how well that'll continue across time as a single point of reference between different blocks is, is still, I think, something we struggle with, how relevant or how much we should rely on that. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. That's all. Commissioner Fong. Yep, thank you. Um, I got a few questions, I guess, similar related to those. Um, so I guess you, so you kind of alluded to this, but we have a list of, of, of streets in the queue now, and how many Streets, I mean, are on the queue now, I guess, um, and, and also how many are streets are generally done a year for the, you know, for a calming project? I should have pulled that up. Uh, the my recollection last time we discussed sort of what had been prior approved was that there was something on the range of seven or eight blocks that had approval. We delivered, I think two or three of those completely in the, the last repaving. Um, 
in 2019. So I think there's still four or five uh, range, but I, I did not check on that for this meeting. Okay, that's fair. Okay, so, that, so it sounds like two or three have been done in the past, since 2019, I guess. And then we have five or, five or seven in the queue. Okay, that's helpful to know. Um, in, terms of, in terms of the process that you guys have um, uh, suggested, so in terms of the prioritization, so I guess, so it, once the idea is that it would come to the commission and would be approved to be added to the list, and then once it's added to the list, I, I wasn't quite understanding exactly how it gets put onto the list, or is it just at the end? I think maybe you mentioned this, but I didn't understand exactly. It sounded like there was some other criteria that we could consider at that time as well. Is that is that what is that right? Yeah, so this is the part that was not really discussed previously that I was trying to, to think through and flesh out. So um, definitely open to, to other thoughts on this. So how I was conceptualizing what we do with a prioritization list as opposed to a yes or no from the commission is that when we have new surveys that are brought before the commission, we have new surveys done and have new information we can look at those within the existing surveys that have been done. So it essentially creates a, a new ranking uh, as we have new information. Um, and then there's a decision point of when we proceed from that ranking, pull, I, pull projects off of that to, to do design and have ready to go. Um, so my thought was don't proceed on design until we have few enough in the queue that that we should expect delivery in a, a nearer term horizon versus a growing list of projects that we've designed with a growing list of blocks that are waiting. Um, so not proceeding to design until we have some foreseeable space to deliver those and better link that. And then the other is at that time, we could also look at if there are new projects, new repaving projects in the queue, is there any match with any of the prioritization ones and proceed with design for those so that they're ready with a repaving project. So that was the other one that we were still trying to link on the opportunistic project delivery um, with other projects that we're doing. Gotcha, that makes sense, thanks. Uh, very helpful, so it sounds like a little bit, we're still sort of figuring out what that process could be a little bit even, even today. Okay, and then my last question I guess is, um, I guess is, is, has there been any research around you know, when we have a street coming project like this, how does that affect traffic on the other streets? Is that, you know, does that mean other streets nearby will also get faster cars, you know, because they're diverted? I'm just, just curious if there's any information we have about that, or if not, it, it may not be something you've studied so far. So we had in the policy previously that we would look at parallel routes. I don't know that a lot of that was done with earlier installations. Um, that is a primary concern with how a lot of these policies are set up, not just here, but in other cities, which is why there is that volume volume threshold. Um, it hasn't been and hasn't really come up a lot in the discussions since I've been at the city in terms of a concern at the commission level or issues brought up in the discussion. Um, so I don't know how much of that is perception versus real. Um, would require a lot more data collection to really be able to answer well. And so if we did wanna keep that in the policy, I think we need to do more to actually collect that and think about how we would, would we go out and actually remove them after installing them um, and sort of what level of diversion would, would that would entail. That makes sense. Thanks. Uh, I might just add that in, in my tenure that that statement of, of following up and checking parallel streets has been mostly aspirational. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 10 years ago, we were in the same place. How do we make this policy? How can we make it work? You know, we're, we're just trying to iterate it to get to a point that it's feasible and, and practical. Um, I know anecdotally, uh, we've had uh, folks from from parallel blocks come to us after after uh, speed humps have gone in, especially, and and said that they perceived uh, traffic to be stronger and faster on their block. I'm I'm not sure that that's really been borne out necessarily by the data. Mm -hmm. um, this is a really interesting arena of of the intersection of perception and and data. Um, it's been very interesting. 
other uh, other commissioner uh, questions? Commissioner Graham. Just two quick questions. Um, what is the like longest length of time that any of the projects that are on the queue has been there? I can look. Uh, I have to pull up our approval, oh. but I'll look for that while we keep discussing. And then I guess the other question I have uh, thinking about this through the eyes of a citizen who wants speed improvements um, is when, and forgive me because I haven't even Googled this, but is there some sort of um, just one pager or something that just even articulates to the citizens what the types of design uh, implementations that the city approves would be, and then also some of the benefits and trade-offs for them. I guess I'm just uh, wondering if that's provided sort of, you know, before people even come to us, whether or not um, that might influence what pe if people determine that they even want to um, pursue something like this. I'm just a little bit worried about, you know, people going through this process and then not really being satisfied by the design outcome that they get. Um, and so just trying to sort of close that communication loop. Yeah, we try to, we do have a page on the city website and in the petition um, that we ask them to go down the block to make, we try to make it very clear about the potential noise and vibration impacts of, of speed humps, speed tables. That is the primary mechanism we have um, to do this relatively cost effectively. The commission has discussed previously other design options. Those just often get to be much bigger projects and really hard to deliver through this kind of this kind of program. Um, so it does generally end up being either striping and stenciling of speed limits and sort of the soft treatment approach or speed humps and speed tables um, for the more physical installation. Thank you. That's all I have. Great. Other commissioner questions? Well, I have one. Can we go back one slide, Justin? Maybe one more. Oh, no, I, it was the, the next one. I'm sorry. So I, I happen to live on a block that uh, did not receive a speed hump, but did receive an alternative treatment and was flagged in the, the, uh, the subcommittee presentation as being the second highest ranked block. Um, I don't believe it just this is just an example. I'm not asking in this needing to change anything on my block. But it is an example of a, a street that did receive a treatment, uh, probably hasn't had a follow up speed survey done for comparison, and could be in a position priority wise to request perhaps a different treatment. Um, so it might be nice to um, to, to uh, either rephrase the second bullet here or at least address in some way blocks that do receive some kind of treatment or a speed hump and it proves to be unsuccessful or, or not satisfactory in some form. And now I'm, I'm slipping into opinion. Um, so if there are no further Commissioner questions, uh, seeing none, let's move it to uh, public questions, if you would, Jeff. Yes, we have one public speaker. Jeremiah, please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, hey, Justin. We were, you were just talking about the traffic surveys, um, COVID-19 has made it, you know, heavy on staff to do these traffic surveys. Um, 
you know, I don't, I don't know how we can move forward, you know, using all this old data and we should make a priority to at least just get one of those traffic surveys. You know, the ones that we have with the air tubes, we could put the air tubes on the ground and it counts cars and it does the speed. Is this, is the air tubes a lot easier than putting up that big trailer with the mile per hour sign? Um, I don't know. I'll volunteer. I'll volunteer to go help public works or something install them. I mean, I don't know. I'm just trying to help out. I'm just trying to figure out a way to where we don't come up with excuses or reasons not to do anything. We should work on solutions. That way we could do something, you know, we could set a goal and say, Hey, we could do one traffic survey a month in Albany you know, and we could, we could go on Craigslist and hire an outside contractor to come in, you know, to work for, you know, minimum wage or something. At least we can create a job, but we can get those numbers. We can get data because it seems like we can't really do things without data. And if we use old data, it's not current, it's just old. And I don't know if anybody's noticed, but it seems like everybody kind of forgot how to drive since COVID came out. And I don't know, like when we go back to school, let's say school goes back in session and kids go back to outdoor classrooms or back to school. And we do have loading and drop off times. I don't know if everybody driving is all of a sudden going to remember how to drive safe um, around our school. So if we can just try at least to get one of those traffic surveys done with the air tubes or something, I mean, just let me know. I mean, I'm here to help and volunteer if I can, but it would be nice if we could come up with a solution to get something done instead of, you know, kind of finding excuses to not do it and COVID-19 and, you know, um, I don't know. I'm just trying to figure out how we could work toward a common goal and still get things happening. Um, so yeah, just let me know what I could do to help, please. And let's try to work on solutions to get some traffic surveys um, and new, some new data. That way we can move forward with these things and have some, you know, some good stuff. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chairman. I don't see any other public comments at this time. Okay, let's bring it back to the commission. Um, and uh, especially if you haven't commented yet, we'd love to hear from commissioners. Commissioner John Adal. Um, so I still think that uh, the recommended changes are pretty good. Um, you know, number of vehicles over 25 miles an hour being the prioritization criteria. Um, looking at uh, having more than 500 vehicles a day sounds reasonable as a minimum threshold. If your volumes are particularly low, um, maybe it's not worth spending the resources there. That's something we could reconsider if we start to uh, clear the queue routinely. Um, the question of what to do about, um, well, certainly the, the block of Santa Fe or anything else, any other block that has had a prior uh, treatment done and maybe isn't satisfied with the results and wants to apply again. I forget whether we have sort of a, a blackout period. You know, we, we just put speed humps in there. We're not going to do another study within two years or five years. Uh, only reason I say that is I, I know that um, we, we always have high hopes that it'll have a big significant difference. And sometimes it does. It, it doesn't always. And I, I think in fairness to everyone else in the city, we kind of have to say we, we've done what was reasonable here. We're going to move on, deal with a few others. Maybe we can come back later. But Maybe saying, you know, one application per five years, 
with a significant project, how to define whether it's significant, if it was paint, if it was something hardscape, I, I'm, I'm totally open to that, but I think that's probably something worth making sure we have uh, in there. Um, I, I do share the concern about uh, data collection and the validity of the data. Obviously, we're going to get lower volumes now than we would under normal conditions, um, but potentially worse speeds because there's no congestion to slow people down uh, or just you know, a, a difference of behavior. And, and you know, once we reopen things and we're back to normal and having school traffic and all those different things, uh, we may see very different dynamics than one would hope better. Um, I don't really know. Um, so the you know, kind of my concern would be, we might collect data and maybe meet the minimum volumes, but the speeds look lousy. Uh, or, you know, if we were to recollect the data a year later, find totally different answers. Um, so part of our assumption is comparing apples to apples when we prioritize different streets. I don't have a really strong sense on that. I just know that a lot of Cities have kind of said the point in collecting data right now because it, it's not going to compare well to normal conditions. Um, what we do with that is, is, you know, I guess up to us. But otherwise, I, I think what we have is pretty solid. And if we can, you know, pin down a couple little details, I'd be ready to recommend it to council. That's it for me. There we go. Sorry, um, Commissioner Fong. Great. Um, yeah, I, I, I think this is great that we have this sort of level of community input so people can suggest that their um, block receives some sort of traffic calming measure. Um, yeah, I think I, I think overall, I think it, there's a lot of good ideas here. In terms of the criteria, I mean, I, I think I'd like to step back and say, like, what are we trying to achieve? And I think like we're trying to achieve safer streets, right? I think that's probably the biggest thing. Um, so I think I, I like the idea of, I think maybe Commissioner Del, Del Rosario mentioned like looking at the number of accidents on the street as part of the criteria, um, since that's, that is very, you know, cor correlated to, um, you know, what we would want to, the safety for that street. Um, you know, I think also another, another thing is also the speed. I don't know if there's a, you know, like for me, I would like to add like a speed bump if I know people are going 40 miles an hour, like that would be a higher priority to me than, you know, maybe a hundred people going 30 miles an hour, um, just because I think that's more likely to cause an accident um, and essentially like a lethal accident. Um, and the other thing I'm sort of thinking about is you know, my question around diverting traffic. If it is like a busy street, like I don't know if it's the best if someone sees, someone sees a lot of traffic on their street, they just want to speed bump to, you know, not have a lot of cars on their street and they just have a speed bump there and then the traffic just goes to the street next, next over and then that's going to create another sort of cascade effect. Um, I don't know if that actually would happen or not, but. I am concerned about a little bit of the just pushing traffic onto other streets. Um, so I think in terms of a criteria, I would like to, you know, have the idea of something around looking at the number of accidents that happened on that street and or the, 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 the I don't know, maybe 85th percentile, whatever it is for the, the, the speed on that street. Um, and, be, and, that, and also, I think, I think we can also include a, um, a volume as one of those weights, but I'd like to see like, I, for me, I think if the criteria is safety, um, that to me, it seems like that would be the better ways to, to you know, identify which, which streets are, are more deserving of something like this. Um, the, the other because of point, I guess, is just, you know, I, I, back to this point of like diverting traffic again, I mean, I, I don't know about the, the min minor arterials, like I wouldn't mind, um, you know, maybe including that is also, we shouldn't be including too many traffic calming on those streets. I'm open to, I'm not, not, not a strong opinion on that one, but um, I just don't want traffic to be moved, just moved to other streets um, and create more problems there. Um, so those, those are my thoughts. Um, and, I, and the last thing I said, and just in terms of the prioritization, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I think that's really good. You know, I, I, ideally we can find the right time for us to do the prioritization. And I, just, so I would hate for us to just keep um, kind of looking at all the different streets and then having it keep getting evaluated um, too many times. Uh, ideally, we can just like, you know, make sure it's streamlined for when we're actually ready to do a project or something like that. Just to, I don't know how busy our, our docket is having just joined. Um, but those are, those are some of my, my thoughts. Thank you. 
Uh, Commissioner Del Rosario, did, were you raising your hand? Yeah, sure. Um, I like uh, uh, Fareed's idea of like a five-year moratorium that seems pretty standard for um, capital projects um, in the right of way. Um, the I would propose that we remove the 40 foot width if we're already identifying the, the, the streets um, that are uh, would not fall under this and which are residential streets, then I don't know if the 40 foot uh, width makes um, makes much of a difference. And then it, it excludes the, the piece of Washington that's that's super wide, um, which I don't think that should be excluded uh, from this. Um, and then I think there might be a few other streets that are, that are like that, the, uh, the uh, east-west streets um, that may, may get closer or exceed 40 feet. Um, and then on the, the collision history, so I'm just thinking of other cities and it seems like there is a response, or well, even in Albany, that there is a response um, to, to um, um, improve uh, the safety of a street when there is some sort of injury, um, a significant collision, fatality. Um, and I don't know if that necessarily needs to be placed into the policy or if the, 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 the out language, right, the, the exemption language that says that there's discretion used um, covers that. Um, but maybe some language about it should be mentioned. I just know that it seems like that that becomes um, um, a, a lightning rod for uh, council members um, and, and community to 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 um, want to um, um, uh, expedite improvements uh, uh, around. So um, I think yeah, the policies are pretty good to to go. It seems like it's 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 what we ask for. And Justin, you 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 use good judgment about um, you know putting in the five hundred um, vehicle minimum. Um, I agree about design. So there should be some sort of threshold about uh, when you want to start design. You don't want to have uh, um, um, outdated designs um, when you want to construct them you know, two years later or something like that. Um, so I guess you need answers for these though, if you wanted to, if we want to um, recommend uh, bringing this forward uh, for, for uh, council consideration. Um, you know, I, I I'm curious to see if, if we can come up with some language about, around the injury stuff or if, if other commissioners um, know how to deal with it in other cities, um, that would also uh, be, be useful. Um, i trying to see if make sure I covered everything in my list. Yeah, I'll, I'll stop there and, and if it comes to mind, I'll, I'll come back. Thanks. Great. Um, Commissioner Graham, did you have more? You're still muted. Um, I think that the language um, I'm in favor of it, um, especially with the, I think some of the things that uh, Commissioner De La Rosario just said, um, I'm a little bit hung up and this is probably not going to make me any uh, favors, but um, I sort of think that with the revised policy, we should consider um, not having these legacy projects hold over or at least um, some, figure out some way to reevaluate them um, within the prioritization. I mean, my question in terms of how long some of these things have been on there, I, I mean, I commiserate with someone who is waiting a long time to see something. And then I also think that, you know, a lot of things can change and priorities can too. So um, that's just my thought on that. Um, and, and then the only other thing I would say is in terms of this um, thought about measuring sort of the impact on other streets, I would also say that just in general, we should be doing some sort of measurement in terms of just trying to figure out if we can um, demonstrate that the uh, design improvements are having an impact on the, the measured um, uh, speed. So to sort of like a KPI of just measuring the success of these types of improvements. So that's all I have. Great. Um, well, I my thoughts are, are varied. Uh, collision history is tough. Um, you know, often the, the reported 
collisions are very different than the perceived injury. You know, the cats that have been run over and not reported and, and you know, the near misses. Um, it seems like it would be really hard to, to quantify. Um, I, perhaps we could add, a, you know, a bullet or a little bit of language about taking collisions into consideration. Um, and then as we go forward, um, see if that's sufficient. I, I just think it would be really hard to, to nail that down in a policy satisfactory. Um, uh, Farida, uh, you know, your idea of a, of a moratorium for reevaluations makes perfect sense. You got to see if something works. Uh, we have to pay reasonable attention to other areas of the city. Um, you know, five years is probably reasonable uh, length of time is that, and I'm assuming that's length of time after uh, the implementation of the, of the calming. And uh, because uh, with our backlogs, that, that, that becomes important. Um, we, we, because we have a backlog, we have a little bit of time here to sort of sort out how we move forward and how quickly we move forward. It, it seems, I, I agree that we don't need to design ahead uh, nearly as much as we have in the past and, and uh, use up staff time. Um, th that is a really sticky issue of, you know, taking something away that's been granted and uh, especially when you have this kind of uh, resonant involvement where they've, they've gathered signatures and they've talked amongst themselves and they, they've hashed out where these speed humps should actually be located um, and it becomes very real in their minds. Um, and uh, maybe that's something we ask for guidance from city council on. Um, that seems like it's a little higher than our pay grade in some ways it seems like a political thing more than a you know a, a, a something that we can decide on our own at least initially from my standpoint um commissioner graham i like your uh, you know your fresh eyes on you know how are people informed about this process and i, I think we have tried to, to inform people as justin says about you know the the relative uh utility of having a speed hump, which is most of what we offer. Um, I personally have always tried to also let people know that what they're asking for is to, you know, really create an obstacle. Um, but an alternative is is somehow, uh, you know, let's just say we, we've seen a lot of blocks come to us over the years. And um, I, I take pains to remind people that, um, you know, it's it's your neighbors for the most part driving on your block and you drive on their block. So, yes, we're, we're interested in slowing down things on your block, but remember that you have responsibility to slow things down elsewhere. And I think what you're saying go, goes along with that. It's, it's, you know, how do we communicate and how do we how do we uh, really set people's expectations? Um, so I think, I think open issues that we, we still have are, uh, what do we do about, um, the current backlog as raised by Commissioner Graham? And, um, do we want to set a reevaluation, uh, moratorium of five years after implementation? Thoughts on that? And just to interject, since there was a question I said I would follow up on in terms of specifics on the backlog and how long, um, looks like we have four blocks awaiting speed humps and speed tables. The oldest was approved in November, 2016, and another one January, 2017. So those are sort of the longest waiting ones I have. There are a couple other ones that we delivered partially, but that are still, so we did deliver part of the recommendation, but there's still elements that are, are waiting as well. So there's a couple other blocks that are partially delivered. 
Thank you. Another question about that, if I can. Oh. Please, uh, Commissioner Fong. Uh, yeah, as also just in terms of the, from the transportation department, I assume that you guys also have a process of identifying streets independent of this process that would require some sort of traffic calming policy. Is that right? This is an addition to what you would already be doing yourselves, or is this the only kind of time that, that this happens? There have been other traffic calming projects that have been delivered outside of this project, outside of this process. Um, the the one that's been in discussion most is North Albany traffic calming related to the developments in El Cerrito Plaza and the spillover sort of discussion of spillover traffic impacts on the, the adjacent block. So that was one that was addressed in relation to that specific problem. There is a traffic management plan, which which spells out some more of the citywide in terms of the related element that often comes up in terms of stop signs or intersection kind of control. Um, whereas this process is mainly focused on mid block kind of slowing. Um, there was one, a couple that have also, actually a couple of the ones that are partially delivered. There's some intersection discussion of intersection design that, that we haven't delivered. Um, so, on the uh, other than that i think the active transportation plan and repaving and the curb work we do is really more, more focused on some of the intersection safety improvements that we deliver separately from this Thank you. commissioner del rosario justin on the the, the two um projects from 2016 27 do you know the 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 traffic volume or what streets are they do you know which project, what projects they are 500 Masonic and a thousand key routes. So I think we looked at both of those. Hold on, let me pull up. One I think is high volume, one is low volume. Um, so thousand key route is there at the far right um, and 500 Masonic is sort of the third one in there. And the, the more, most recent one that was discussed at the commission is the 1000 Masonic one on the far left. Okay. To, to answer um, uh, Commissioner McCroskey's uh, questions, um, I agree with the, the five-year moratorium um, after, uh, after construction. Um, I don't know if everyone has any, um, if anyone agrees with the removal of the 40 foot um, width. And then I was thinking um, to Commissioner McCrossey's uh, comments about the, the uh, collision history. Uh, maybe it goes under step two special circumstances. And there's a bullet point that you could, could be put there. It says engineering judgment may supersede specific criteria in this policy. And you can put it in there, including um, collision history. Sounds good to me. Um, I'm sorry, I skipped over the 40 foot width and uh, I, I agree with you on that. Uh, Commissioner Javidal, raise your hand. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I think the, the five-year moratorium is probably a good threshold after construction, um, eliminating the 40 foot width since we've got the classifications instead. Um, let's see, as I, I agree with the approach to uh, using engineering judgment, uh, if there's a documented collision pattern, um, and that particular wording is, is one that I've seen used in other places. I know Berkeley talks about a documented collision pattern, and obviously you're looking for something that's correctable by traffic calming. It's totally unrelated. That's where the engineering judgment comes in. Documented? I got my vent bills for the collisions right here. <laughs> Well, that's that's just it. it it's we, we need to know they happened. We need to know when and why and, and things like that. Um, you know, this, this isn't vision zero. So we're not looking to say, oh, you know, parked cars getting total doesn't matter. We might still say, you know, an engineering judgment that even though no one got hurt, we think that's important because there have been so many parked cars hit that you know, the, the odds are increased that some someone will physically be hurt as well. Um, so again, I, I think that rather than us try to dictate right here without all the data in front of us, 
let's leave it to engineering judgment and, and that can pick up a lot of you know very specific context sensitive information that we might otherwise overlook I, I think otherwise I'm pretty happy with it the idea of um, doing before and after studies I know we've always kind of wanted to do that and it tends to be do we have the the capacity and, and you know, time and money to do it. If we do, that's fine. I, I don't want to tie our hands and dictate that. It would be interesting to see, you know, if diversions happen, for example, you know, now you, instead of measuring one street, you're measuring three streets and doing it before and after. So it's six times as much data collection. Um, historically, the, the engineering wisdom has been speed humps don't really divert much traffic. Um, Obviously, as, as we've heard tonight, you know, sometimes the neighbors don't feel that way. So it, it might not be a bad thing every once in a while to get some data that helps to validate that. Um, but I, again, I wouldn't bake that into the policy, just saying, you know, consider doing that. So otherwise, I, I, I like everything I've heard. Any other? Oh, Commissioner Fong. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, the five-year moratorium, that seems to make sense after construction, like everyone mentioned, seems fair to me. Um, the 40-foot width seems, yeah, we have already have some other uh, criteria in there. That seems like it could be okay. Um, yeah, I'm glad that we can consider the adding the, um, maybe something around the accident history, something like that, um, into the criteria. I'm still open. I, I, I personally also like the idea of adding in speed as well. Like, you know, make the, if there's a lot of, especially over, 40 miles an hour or something like that, I think should get even more priority. Um, but maybe that could also be part of this, this discretion of the engineers. Um, so that, that might all be already baked in, but that's something that I, I'm, I'd be more, I'm, I think should be prioritized if there are people that are going exceptionally high speeds, the, those streets should be prioritized. I think we've always seen some outliers um, at both extreme high and low speed but they tend to be outliers and not part of a pattern. So I, I, that's helpful. I think leaving that up to discretion is reasonable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you would yes, yeah. know more of the history of that than I do. And, and I think the, the, the change in process moving away from 85th percentile, I think we saw that correlation of volume with speed. So I think it hopefully incorporates it in the in, in, in the analysis uh, that the subcommittee did. Um, I don't know if we have to address like excessive speed or nothing, but it, it doesn't seem like, it. I think I think the correlation was there. And Commissioner Javna, you're on the subcommittee. I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on that. I, I, I think that Justin presented it well. Um, you know, Preston did quite an elaborate analysis of the, the data. Um, and, and, and we had conversations around this exact point you know, looking at how many cars between 25 and 30, how many between 30 and 35, et cetera. And, and he looked at it both ways and it, it really made no difference. Okay. So we can knock ourselves out doing a bunch of extra analysis. And if the answer came out the same, let's not bother. Let's make it easy for everyone to understand and for staff to implement. So that I, I think that what we have is actually pretty elegant um, and, and statistically picks up those outliers anyway because they they don't stand out and change the results oh great well, that's helpful that's really helpful yeah that yeah, that study yes I, I kind of just was able to breeze through it but i quite understand that 85 percent all the time but that's good that you guys were thinking about that when you when you develop that that's really helpful okay what about uh what about our our uh, our uh, speed humps and waiting or blocks in waiting. Um, uh, we've heard uh, Commissioner Graham speak about it a little bit. Um, I, I propose sending up to council, but I'd also be potentially, as I think about it, I'd be potentially interested in just clearing out our queue by, by going through the, the process that we've already set up over the next couple of years. Um, I, it sounds like we could clear out our queue and just in what three to five years, two to four years. It, it's part mostly a mark question, but um, I think we're looking at those. We're probably under two years in terms of budget. It's more a matter of when we can 
actually um, have the project management and delivery as a Carvalone project. We have just so many projects in the queue. It's more a matter. It's why we wanted to leave open the, the ability to, to pair these with repaving projects is it's just a, it's just difficult for us right now to, to have the standalone project. So I, I don't know. I think probably most of the ones still in the queue could be delivered in one project. I don't know when that project would take place. So if we only did ones that are currently in the queue with repaving projects on their streets, that might take a lot longer. Okay. That would be cheaper because it's Other commissioner thoughts about this issue? Yeah, tell us. Is the is the language about um, existing projects in the queue in the in the policy? It wasn't it written in the policy. Um, it's maybe sort of should be in the council direction in terms of when we switch to the policy versus needing to speak to the legacy po projects in the policy itself, but. It, whatever the commission wants to do, I guess. It's sort of cleaner long-term to not have to, to speak to the old ones, but um, yeah, we could just mention them in the policy as well. Either way. Justin, can you give us any idea in round numbers how much um, clearing out the queue is going to cost? Um... I'd have to look back when we last, I think when we were looking at the backlog in 2019, my recollection is it was in the 35 to 50,000 per speed hump or per block when you factored in the project management and all the stuff as a standalone. Um, but I'd have to double check. It's just been a little while since I was looking at that but that i think would be the scale of <laughs> zeros at least yeah um, thank you that's helpful I just, may, may i just clarify the um why i was asking about time was not as much um the cost but um thinking about the turnover on streets and if you have a 65 percent majority you know seven years ago how applicable is that to the current um uh knowing the real estate market is over so that was uh particularly my thought um that you know someone would it, it would all of a sudden be under construction and then people would you know i could see just as many citizens being concerned that this was being put into their street and and then feeling like they, they weren't engaged in the process yeah I mean, it could be a do thing where like if it's not prioritized within X number of years, then it falls off the lists or something like that automatically. Is that or is that is that bad? <laughs> I mean, I also support uh, Commissioner McCroskey's um, notion of just having the policy with the um, with the uh, items we addressed earlier that I think Commissioner Dill, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> Del Rosario. It's it's not the name. It's the late hour um, suggested. But then I I mean I think the council is going to discuss this anyway, whether or not it's in the actual policy or not. So I'm not quite sure we have to you know make a decision on it. So that's just my thought. I I think that that might be a good way to go is is just to uh, to pass the policy along and say by the way we came up with this question that we need your help deciding here are the relative costs and timing you know we're looking for some direction and they could they could choose to punt and not give us an opinion and we could just move forward as we go through the process and keep this as an active issue that would be another way to go or they could give us some direction yeah I, 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 yeah just thinking about it, it does seem complicated because on the one hand if it's been on there on the queue for a long time you think they should get prioritized if they've been waiting but the other hand like commissioner graham was saying maybe if it's too long then maybe that isn't actually 
something you want to prioritize if it's that no longer representing that you know the the eight members that had asked for that. No, it's not clear cut, I guess. Double star. So so perhaps the I'm I'm all I'm all for a good pun. Um, but so perhaps the um, the uh, discussion that we're having can be um, characterized in the narrative um, that staff puts together for our city council um, um, around this item. Um, but I'm, I, I think we're, we're, you know, given that, I think we're um, ready to put forward a recommendation to city council. Um, so I'll, I'll put forward the, the motion to, um, to city council to update the uh, traffic calming policy with the uh, three amendments, I believe, which are five-year moratorium on um, on uh, 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 reconsideration. Yeah, that <laughs> um, removal of the forty-foot uh, width, and then um, mention of uh, of collision history. I think Farid had some uh, better terminology for it, um, but to include that as well. Second that motion. Um, if you want the terminology, a, a documented collision pattern uh, is something to be evaluated in engineering judgment. Sounds good. Great. So I need a, a second. And uh, Fareed is uh, seconded. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Graham, were you trying to second as well? I, I didn't quite get that. No, I was pointing to Commissioner. We're all in different places on each other. <laughs> Thank you, though. Um, yeah. um, great. I get punchy at this late hour, too. Um, so uh, we have a, a, a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Uh, do we need to take a roll call vote on this? Yes. Okay. Would you please do so? Commissioner Del Rosario. Aye. Commissioner Fong. Aye. Commissioner Graham. Aye. Commissioner Javindo. Aye. And Vice Chair McCroskey. Aye. And thank Chair you for Chair. setting us up for an easy motion with a good policy. All right. Um, my computer is going slow. I'm looking for our next item. Help me out if you can. Appreciation for past commissioners. Right. Thank you. Justin, do you want to introduce this? It, I will be uh, oh, taking care of this one. Um, let me uh, bring up my screen. We have drafted for the commission um, consideration to resolutions of appreciation for our recently departed commissioners. And um, uh, these were completed this afternoon. So apologies that they're not um, yet posted on the web page. But um, what I'd like to do is read them. And if it's acceptable, the, the commission could take action on them this evening. Um, I'll start with a proclamation of appreciation to Amy Paulson for her service on the Transportation Commission. Whereas Amy Paulson began her service on the City of Albany Transportation Commission in January 2019. Whereas beginning in January 2020, Amy served as chair of the Transportation Commission. Whereas shortly after her appointment as chair, COVID-19 shelter in place mandates were imposed, requiring Amy to lead the commission and meeting attendees through the transition to virtual meetings. Whereas throughout her term of service, Amy provided the commission insights based on her professional experience as an environmental planning consultant. And whereas Amy helped guide the commission through updating safety and street parking on city streets associated with Albany Unified School District modernization projects at Albany Middle School, Albany High School, and Ocean View Elementary School. And whereas Amy contributed to the modernization of the commission's enabling ordinance leading to the transition from the Traffic and Safety Commission to the Transportation Commission. And whereas Amy also provided guidance to city staff on the planning of improvements on San Pablo Avenue being undertaken by the city and by the Alameda County Transportation Commission. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Transportation Commission does express its appreciation to Amy Paulson for her service to the Transportation Commission and wishes her the best in her future endeavors. And. Um, 
would be complete with your approval would be include the phrase passed and adopted by the Transportation Commission of the City of Albany at its meeting on the 28th day of January 2021. So I'd be happy to take any comments or questions on this or any additions uh, if you'd like, um, or you could um, take action on this. Well, so we have we have two different resolutions. Um, I think I'm required to open up for public comment. Why don't we just take public comment on? I could read the second one, and then we could open for public comment on. That both sounds of good. It. Yes. Okay. Um, I need to switch my screen here. It's already showing the. Oh, okay. It was just slow on this computer. This is a proclamation of appreciation to Preston Jordan for his service on the Transportation Commission. Whereas Preston Jordan began his service on the City of Albany Transportation Commission in January 2019, whereas throughout his term of service, Preston brought years of experience and analytical skills to bear as an advocate for tra active, tra active modes of transportation. Whereas Preston has been a stalwart advocate for implementation of the city's active transportation plan within the city's capital improvement projects. And whereas Preston provided the commission a detailed analytical analysis of MTC developed street saver pavement management software, exposing biases that limited considerations for bicycle and transit routes. Whereas Preston has been instrumental in the successful implementation of the city's sidewalk rehabilitation program, making the community safer for people to walk and reducing the city's exposure to claims from the injuries. And whereas Preston advocated for updating the traffic calming policy to better align policy risks with risks it is meant to address. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Transportation Commission does express its appreciation to Preston right. Jordan for his service to the Transportation Commission and wishes him the best as a newly elected member of the Albany City Council. Again, this would be, with your approval, be so include the final phrase passed and adopted by the Transportation Commission of the City of Albany at its meeting on the 28th day of January 2021. Great. Any commissioner questions before we open up to public comment? Seeing none, Jeff, if you would do the honors. Okay, thank you. Jeremiah, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, the proclamation, or I don't know if it's a proclamation or not, but for Preston Jordan, that's great. You know, he did put a lot of input on the Transportation and Safety Committee. It was, yeah, it was and safety. I remember um, traffic and safety. I think it was, you guys did have the word safety in there, at least used to. Preston um, did a lot of good things for safety, right? Um Strollers and rollers. Did you guys throw that in there? Strollers and rollers. Maybe you guys might want to add strollers and rollers. Um, you know, um, so, and also something about safe routes to school. I think Preston was in on safe routes to school and strollers and rollers. Um, you did mention bike paths, um, but was Preston also involved in those bike um bike racks you know they're a metal bicycle on solano you see them they're all different colors it's a bike rack but it's also a metal bicycle um so yeah just trying to give preston some some shout outs if anything was overlooked um i know i think he was in agreement on we should push for school zones i know he's um, he's liked the idea about Albany having school zones in the municipal code book. Um, and also, what else did Preston do? He, yeah, for the sidewalk rehabilitation on Solano Avenue. I know that's still underway. Um, he always had a lot of good comments. Uh, maybe you can include some policies that he implemented. Because I know Preston was really into um, policies, right? He always tried to recommend a new policy to create a new policy on some sort of guideline or some sort of city policy. Uh, he's done a lot of work. And 
I think for the future, for everybody that is on one of these committees and then, you know, their time is up. Can we also post it on the city's KALB uh, TV channel? Some sort of recognition also. It's, you know, it's going to go to the city meeting and then someone's going to read the proclamation and then it's done. But it would be kind of cool if everybody got recognized on Albany TV. Um, you know, and also, you know, make school safer. I got to throw it a shout out for, you know, school zones. And the speed bumps, um, I hope more speed bumps go in because it's all about kid safety. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremiah. Um, I don't see any other public comments. Great. Well, thank you. Um, commissioner comments, additions? I have to say, the, the, these uh, are very comprehensive and uh, specific, and uh, I'm impressed. Uh, I think these are great. Um, Commissioner Del Rosario? Yeah, I second that. Um, and, and, and there's no question that um, both uh, Commissioner Jordan and Commissioner Paulson have, have done a lot for uh, the city of Albany and, and, the, and the communities. Um, but I think the resolutions um, accurately portray what they what they did on their time on, on the commission. And therefore, um, um, I move uh, that we adopt the resolutions of appreciation for Commissioner Amy Paulson and Commissioner Preston Jordan. I have a move. I do have a second. I'll second it. Commissioner Javadal. Any discussion? Um, I guess we take a roll vote. Commissioner Del Rosario. Aye. Commissioner Fong. Aye. Commissioner Graham. Aye. Commissioner Javendal. Aye. Vice Chair McCroskey. Absolutely. Motion carries. Great. Thank you, staff, for the, the great specific writing in the You're welcome. The uh, motion in the uh, citations. What do we call them? I'm sorry. Must be getting late. Uh, did we go past the 9.30 deadline? Yeah. <laughs> I think it slipped by. If you could do a motion to continue to at least a few more minutes. I move that we continue until 10 o'clock. I have a move. I got a second from Fong. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Great. Motion carries. Uh, announcements? Uh, you have item 5-4, selection of chair and Sorry. vice chair. Yes, absolutely. Who uh, can we get a staff introduction to that one? I, I think I would mess it up. Yeah, it's just real brief. Um, it's a two-step process. First, by selecting the chair, any one of you can nominate someone, and um, the um, the the last person and a second is not required for a nomination you might want to check to see if the person who's been nominated is interested in taking on the responsibility. Um, and if there's more than one person nominated for, for the, the chair or vice chair, then the last person nominated would be voted on first. So you'd go in reverse order to work back through the list if there's more than one person. Uh, so you'll do the chair first. Once that person, that's, that person is identified, then go back and do the vice chair through the same procedure. Any questions about that? Commissioner Rosario? Um, are we uh, doing question and public comment and back to comment? Or should we? I don't see any uh, hands raised for public comment. OK. Great. Uh, Commissioner McCrossy, you, you did such a smashing job today. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you're interested in becoming chair. I'm always willing to lead the meetings and to chair. And uh, I'd be interested in having a, uh, a new member co-chair, either Graham or Fong, uh, to sort of help get them up to speed and then have them serve next year. Okay. So um, I uh, nominate uh, Commissioner McCroskey as chair. I'll second that. 
I don't believe a second is required, but thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> well, then I nominate Commissioner Fong for vice chair. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's do the vote. If there are no other nominations for chair, then we should do a real call vote for chair, um, and then we can we can take uh, Commissioner Graham's uh, nomination for vice chair after that. So uh, let's make sure. Are there any other uh, nominations for chair? Uh, could you take a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Del Rosario. Aye. Commissioner Fong. Aye. Commissioner Graham. Aye. Commissioner Javindal. Aye. Vice Chair McCroskey. Yes. And thank you. So uh, let's uh, move on to the vice chair. And I believe we have a, a nomination. No, I was actually making a horrible joke. I'm going to let that one. I'm not going to put him on the spot like that. W were you saying you're not interested? <laughs> What, what is involved exactly with the vice chair? So the vice chair fulfills uh, the duties of the chair when the chair is unavailable. And mostly that is uh, setting the agenda for the meetings or help working with staff to set the agenda for the meetings and then running the meetings. Also, if, uh, if the chair has to, uh, to recuse themselves from an item for any reason and, and step away, uh, then the vice chair takes over at that time. Okay. And we, we like to uh, you know, give someone an experience as vice chair or the opportunity for experience, whether that actually happens or not is another thing entirely. And uh, that also prepares them to think about being chair and, and uh, certainly over the next year, um, whoever is vice chair would have a chance to sort of tune into what's going on uh, in the flow of the meeting and, and then be prepared to take over. Does that interest you? <laughs> if it's not that much, if, unless anyone else wants to, to jump in, but. Well, we try and share the duty around. And uh, it's it's a good way to sort of uh, bring a new person in and, and uh, gets you, uh, hopefully gives you a chance to more actively be involved and in thinking about the process and asking questions. Uh, we think it's a good way to, uh, or I think it's a good way to, uh, to bring new people in and, and uh, get them involved. So would, would either of our new people be interested? I, I, I'm seeing some interest from Fong. I'm maybe not interest. Yes, and nominate Commissioner Fong. <laughs> <laughs> we have a nomination. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, I'll ask for a roll vote. Commissioner Del Rosario. Aye. Commissioner Fong. Aye. Commissioner Graham. Hey. Commissioner Javindo. Hi. And um, now Chair McCroskey. Hi. Don't Where's worry, uh, Sadie, your time will come. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's clear that I am not following along as of yet, so I have lots to learn. I wouldn't say that at all. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we all, you know, not only we're we dealing with the Zoom environment, but um, there, there's there's a lot of angles on on each item at any time, so cut yourself some slack. We're glad to have you here. We're glad to have both of the new people here, and uh, we'll move right along to uh, upcoming agendas. Am I right? Uh, announce item seven. Oh, uh, excuse me. Item six is announcements, and then item seven is future agenda items. So any staff announcements? announcements? No staff announcements tonight. I usually we announce do. events, but <laughs> <laughs> so we'll keep moving on. To... We, we do have a public comment, um, right. request for a public comment. Great. So Jeremiah, please go ahead. Oh uh, yeah, future agenda item, um, <clears throat> adding school zones to the municipal code book. Um, if nobody knows, I've been trying to get the city of Albany school zones in the municipal code book for over 10 years 10 years i've been trying and you could do some research school zones is in every other municipal code book in every other city in the entire bay area i think el cerrito might be the only other one that doesn't have it but check berkeley municipal code book um 
go to the glossary or index to the letter S, you'll find school zones. It refers to slower speed around schools, you know, and double fines for tickets around schools. And without school zones, our city is not getting the state school zone grant, which pays for crossing guards and adds money to the budget to put up high visibility pedestrian signs and push button LED crosswalks. Um, school zones is very important. And I hope this new committee uh, will recommend it to council and we can give it another shot. Um, because I know Javondale may know something about Berkeley school zones, but anybody on this committee, please do some research about school zones. It, it's not the map in Albany. It's not the color coded school zone map from the school district. You know, if you live by Marin, you go to Marin school, that's the wrong school zone. Um, it's school zones. You could just type school zone on Google and every other state has it. Every other city in, in the country has school zones. And Albany is about schools. We got the number one school district in the Bay Area. And it's kind of embarrassing that we don't have school zones. It kind of seems like the city doesn't care about safety of our kids. Um, so I hope it doesn't take another 10 years, you know, it's for the kids. And the, the sad part is the kids, the students don't know, the parents don't know, so they can't speak up for themselves. But I know um, we can't even, it was difficult. I was working with Aleda and I got two pedestrian signs put um, on Cornell and Talbot from Solano. As soon as you turn toward Marin, there's high visibility crossing signs. And um, Elena, she couldn't put the word school underneath it because we don't have school zones. So she was like, Jeremiah, we can't put the word school because we don't have school zones. But we, we did anyway. If you look on Talbot, there's a word school underneath the pedestrian sign. So please, future agenda item, sooner or later, I'm going to suggest it every time, school zones. Thank you. I see no other public comments. Thank you. Um, I previously offered to speak with Jeremiah personally and, and talk about how we have looked at school zones. So I, I will reiterate that and uh, move along. Um, you may have noticed that uh, there was some publicity around um, uh, transportation and Ocean View School. Uh, I'm hoping we'll see that in the near future that the school district decided to wait on that. Um, what else have we got coming up in the near future? Aside from the Ocean View Elementary Access, uh, the Ohlone Trail Safety Improvement Civil Design was discussed would be is planned to come to the commission next month and soon after that the marine paving designs. All right, I'll also mention that um, every two years we uh, work on a new work plan for the commission. And uh, apparently the city council still has yet to do their sort of uh, planning and visioning. So we'll wait for that. And then we'll uh, help incorporate that into a new work plan for the next two years for the, uh, the transportation commission. The transportation commission, which also by the way, has in its description, the word safety, but not in its title. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have the agenda in front of me, but I think that brings us to the end of our agenda tonight and we're certainly out of time. So thank you all and to our new members and staff, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in February. Thank you. Thanks, and before we hang up, I, I will uh, offer to both uh, new commissioners that uh, if you have questions, you know, staff can answer them. I'm happy to answer them with you. Uh, you know, it's not a great idea to go have coffee now, but, you know, I'm certainly willing to have a conversation over the phone or Zoom or whatever you're comfortable with or shouting across the park. That works, too. Um, what, whatever works for you. Uh, I want to make sure that you get the information you need and, uh, and feel comfortable participating because that's what makes it all work. And I think we saw that work tonight. So thank you for stepping right up. Thanks, Ken. That did work for all of you guys.